Yes? Okay, sorry. All right, good morning. Good morning. I am Councilmember Donovan Richards of the 31st District in Queens, and I'm proud to chair the Committee on Public Safety. I want to thank Councilmember uh, Rory Lansman for co chairing this important hearing today as well. I also want to thank the members of the Public Safety Committee who are here. I believe we're joined by Councilmember uh, Powers, Brandon Rose, and Lansman could acknowledge his committee members as they come in, and Cohen as well. Today we will be examining the city's enforcement of marijuana laws. We all know that the possession and use of recreational marijuana is illegal in New York pursuant to state law. But as laws continues to change across the country, we must ask ourselves what the value is of our local policy and weigh that value against the impact it has on our communities. Unfortunately, the most recent numbers show that in our city, the enforcement of marijuana laws continue to be a social and racial justice issue. Last year, only 9% of low-level marijuana arrests were of white individuals, while over 86% of those arrested were black and Hispanic. Though the overall number of arrests for marijuana have gone down, the racial disparities have not changed one bit, and arrests are still too common in communities of color. Marijuana arrests can have serious consequences on a person's job, living situation, and child care arrangements, not to mention immigration consequences. Today I hope to have a critical conversation about our current enforcement policy and the ways it has been effective as well as the ways in which it needs to be improved. The Public Safety Committee is also hearing two pieces of legislation today. Intro number 605, sponsored by Council Member Levin, which will require the police department to submit reports on the enforcement of marijuana possession, and resolution number 177, which calls upon the New York State Legislature to amend the penal law to include individuals in police custody as being categorically incapable of consenting to sexual uh, conduct with a police officer. Thank you all for being here today. I'll now turn uh, the mic over to my co-chair, Councilmember Rory Lansman. Thank you, Councilmember Lansman, Lansman as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Councilmember Rory Lansman, chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and I'm happy to be co-hosting this hearing with the Public Safety Community Committee and Chair Donovan Richards. We are joined by committee members, Councilmember uh, Debbie Rose and Councilmember Andy Cohen. And as more council members from the committee come in, I will recognize them. Um, my committee's particular interest in the mayor's 2014 marijuana arrest policy is its impact on the prosecution of such cases by our district attorneys, the handling of drug possession cases by our public defenders, and its overall impact on the functioning of the judicial system. As Chairman Richards uh, may have described, in 2014, the mayor pledged to fundamentally change the city's approach to low-level marijuana possession by treating such offenses as a violation rather than as a misdemeanor. Instead of prosecuting individuals for criminal possession of marijuana in the fifth degree under Penal Law Section 221.10, they would receive a criminal summons for un unlawful possession of marijuana, a violation <clears throat> under Penal Law 221.05 and appear in summons court. The overwhelming majority of New Yorkers bemoaned the overcriminalization of simple marijuana possession and the racial disparities in marijuana enforcement were unconscionable. More than 90% of all charges were brought against people of color. Since the announcement of this new policy, the number of misdemeanor arrests decreased from 26,000 in 2014 to 16,500 about in 2015, but have climbed back to around 18,000 in 2016 and 2017. Fewer marijuana misdemeanor arrests mean fewer arraignments, mean fewer defendants spending time at Rikers Island for want of small amounts of bail, mean lower caseloads for both assistant district attorneys and public defenders, and mean lower dockets across the court system. So why has the decline stalled? And our, are our district attorney's prosecution policies in sync with the mayor's? Do some of them even exceed the mayor's? 
and if so, should more follow their lead? And why are 91 percent of those showing up in our courts for low-level marijuana possession still people of color? And how do our DAs address this disparity? I look forward to finding answers to these questions at today's hearing and perhaps to finding some consensus on how to move forward so that the criminal justice system, our police, prosecutors, defenders, and courts can better realize both the letter and the spirit of the mayor's 2014 marijuana policy. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, we'll now hear from, uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Cabrera, and we will now hear from our first panel. Uh, any responses to it? Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer honestly to council member questions today? Yes, I do. You may begin. Right. Good morning, Chair Richards, Chair Lansman, and members of the council. I'm Chief Dermot Shea, Chief of Crime Control Strategies for the New York City Police Department. I'm here today accompanied with Susan Herman, the NYP PD's Deputy Commissioner of Collaborative Policing, Olab, Oleg Chernavsky, the NYPD's Director of Legislative Affairs. On behalf of Police Commissioner James O'Neill, I want to thank the City Council for the opportunity to speak with you today about the NYPD's enforcement of marijuana laws. The crime reductions that New York City achieved in 2017 were categorically historic. The lowest per capita murder rate since 1951 the fewest shootings ever recorded in the modern era, robberies, burglaries, and auto thefts also at the lowest levels. The gains the department made may seem incredible, but there are very credible reasons why the crime context in New York City is different from the experience of many other parts of this country. They include the dedicated NYPD officers who work on the streets every day, committed community residents in each borough, our local community leaders, including members of the council. They also include relationships the department has been forging and strengthening over the past several years as we extend our neighborhood policing philosophy to all aspects of the department's work. Declining crime has been matched by similar declines in enforcement actions, specifically low-level enforcement. The department made 100,000, over 100,000, fewer arrests in 2017 than it did just four years ago made roughly 180,000 fewer stops, and issued far fewer summonses overall. Over the last several years, New York City has demonstrated that it can enhance fairness without sacrificing safety or responsiveness to community concerns. Turning to the topic of today's hearing, the police department's current marijuana policy was instituted in 2014. Under the policy, officers are instructed to charge the penal law violation of unlawful possession of marijuana when he or she observes a person in possession of 25 grams or less of marijuana in public view, instead of charging criminal possession of marijuana in the fifth degree, 221.10, a B misdemeanor. In essence, our criminal, a criminal court summons is issued for possession of small amounts of marijuana. Nonetheless, there are exceptions to the policy. A summons will not be issued for possession where the individual has an active warrant the person is arrested for an, uh, another unrelated offense, or there is evidence of intent to sell. Moreover, a person can only be issued a summons if they have a valid form of government ID. In the event that a person does not have ID, officers will support efforts to positively identify the person, including allowing the person to conduct, contact a third party to obtain that ID. Officers will make an arrest, however, and charge the B misdemeanor 221.10 of the penal law for possession of 25 grams or less of marijuana if it is burning in public. When an arrest occurs, it is important to note that the arrestee may be eligible still for a desk appearance ticket at the local precinct. The issuance of a desk appearance ticket permits the arrestee to be, to be released from the department's custody within hours, provides a future court appearance date, and avoids processing through central booking. Since this policy was established, there has been a 40% decline in marijuana misdemeanor arrests. That's from 2013 to 2017. In addition to making fewer arrests, the department is having more summonses, is issuing more summonses for marijuana possession, allowing New Yorkers to avoid arrest and jail time. 
Criminal summonses for marijuana possession were up 58% in 2017 when compared to 2013. It would be presumptuous to not acknowledge that the enforcement of marijuana laws is a charged issue, that there is a robust public debate among public safety professionals, scholars, advocates, and elected officials on calibrating the appropriate law enforcement response to the seriousness of the particular incident. The overwhelming majority of arrests or summonses for marijuana come from community complaints. Public marijuana use remains a concern for New Yorkers. In 2017, there were nearly 26,000 911 calls complaining about the use of marijuana, an increase of 12% from 2016. 311 calls complaining about marijuana use also significantly increased in 2017. The NYPD has an obligation to be responsive to community concerns. This also must be acknowledged within the public debate. Our policy seeks to balance enforcing the law in a fair and rational manner, while also recognizing that New Yorkers continue to regularly contact the NYPD about illegal conditions involving marijuana. The police department remains committed to keeping New Yorkers safe, reducing crime, and ensuring the fair enforcement of the law, including the marijuana laws. Before concluding my testimony, I will address Intro 605. Intro 605 would require the department to quarterly report on arrests and criminal summonses for marijuana possession, disaggregated by demographics, borough, and precinct. Over the last several years, the department has collaborated with the council on a number of reporting bills in order to provide valuable data to the public and increase transparency, and we look forward to working with the council on this particular bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My colleagues and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. And I'll go to uh, my colleague, Councilman Bertrago, who's sponsoring uh, intro today, resolution today for a statement. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for, for your time and for, and for your support on an issue that is uh, very critical to this council and to me personally. Um, Again, first, uh, thank you to Chair Richards, who is a co-sponsor uh, of my resolution, uh, as well as to Rory Wensman, Councilman Rory Wensman, for giving me the opportunity to speak about Resolution 177. As many of you are aware, a teenage girl was raped by two Brooklyn South narcotics detectives in my district in September 2017. The detectives tried to mount a defense by claiming it was consensual. They have since resigned, but we need strong laws in place to make sure this never happens again. My resolution 177 calls on the New York State Legislature to amend the penal law section 130.05 to include police custody as being categorically incapable of consenting to sexual conduct with a police officer. The New York State Assembly recently passed the bill of Assembly Member Ed Bronstein, who I've been working with and whose bill is based on my resolution and is now up to the Senate to act. I also have a bill, Intro 571, which prohibits sexual contact between police and peace officers and individuals in their custody. But my resolution we're hearing today actually addresses the root of the problem, which is the loophole in the state penal code. New York State law wisely takes into account the impact that in involvement with the criminal justice system has on the ability of individuals to give sexual consent. By law, those incarcerated are incapable of giving consent to corrections officers, and those under community supervision are incapable of giving consent to their parole officers. The power dynamics between a trusted agent of our criminal justice system and an individual under supervision mean that no sexual consent can be given entirely free from coercion. Unfortunately, state law does not currently apply the same rigorous standard of consent to, in to incidents of sexual conduct contact between a police officer and someone under arrest, temporarily detained, or otherwise subject to law enforcement activity. There can be no meaningful consent when you are in the custody of a law enforcement officer, and all law enforcement must be held to the same standard. It is our duty as elected officials to make sure our laws protect survivors of sexual assault, and it's imperative that the city council has more conversation about the nature 
of consent and power dynamics. And again, as we gather here, the survivor of that sexual assault in my district now has to relive the entire trauma all over again with a public trial. So it, it is uh, of the utmost urgency that we act, and I appreciate the support of, of, the, of the chair and my colleagues in the city council, and we call upon Albany to immediately amend the law uh, to make sure that this never happens again. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Traeger, and we're also joined by uh, Councilmember Ballone as well. All righty, so we'll uh, hop right in. Um, so thank you, Chief Shea, for, for your testimony. So I want to just read through a, a, a few facts on uh, marijuana arrests under the de Blasio administration uh, in his first three years. So, so I'm going to go through these stats. So under Koch, uh, in his first three years as mayor, he had 6,000 uh, pot arrests, on average 2,000 yearly. Under Dinkins, 3,000 with 1,000 arrests yearly. Under Giuliani, 18,000 arrests in his first three years, with 6,000 uh, yearly. Under Bloomberg, 112,000 arrests for marijuana in his first three years as mayor, with 37,000 annually. And now under the current mayor in his first three years, 61,000 uh, arrests uh, in his first three years, with an average of 20,000. So when you look at the comparisons, uh, even looking at uh, the Giuliani years, where he averaged 6,000 a year, to see 20,000 under an administration that has certainly come in and said they are going to correct uh, the wrong from the past, do you find these numbers to be astounding? Um, and I know we've made some changes. So I just want to hear a, a little bit more on uh, where we're headed, uh, being that we're still seeing uh, 20,000 arrests per year uh, under marijuana. Thank you. So I think it's important to see the context there of, of that quite a, quite a length of time from the 80s to literally 30 years later. Um, New York City peaked in the number of arrests they make overall, 2010, 2011. And that was not in that, that long ago. Um, from 2010, 2011, we're down about 30, over 30% 30 in arrests. If you want to go closer to the recent time frame, 2013 to now, um, we're down close to 27% overall in arrests. That's overall. When you look at marijuana related. Compared to 2013 to now, we're 2013 down to 2017, which wasn't that long ago, we've cut nearly. 30% of the arrests mm -hmm. and, and manage to do that at a time when we're balancing all the other issues uh, that we deal with and face and, and doing quite successfully by almost any measure in terms of crime, overall index crime, and violence. When you look at marijuana-related arrests, uh, since 2013, we're down nearly 40%, 38% uh, of my numbers. And from its peak in 2011, in a six-year period, we, we've cut 65% of the marijuana arrests. So uh, I, I hear the numbers you quoted and, and the first three years of different mayors, um, but I just want to say that a 65% arrest is significant. Um, we continue to look for other ways where appropriate and in the balance of public safety where we can further reduce uh, not just marijuana arrest, but a any type of arrest, but it will always be under the umbrella of uh, public safety and responsiveness to uh, complaints. Now, there, do you perceive there being a correlation between marijuana and violent crimes? Is there a correlation between the two, would you say? At times, there certainly is. Um, it's not the only uh, factor in violence. Um, I, I, would, I would put... M you know, there are, there are a number of factors citywide that we see uh, involved in violence. Gangs at the top. Um, I would put money up right near the top. Um, so when you speak about violence wherever, uh, and marijuana, wherever there is money to be made, uh, we often see whether it's home invasions, whether it's robberies. Uh, it's not just specific or unique to marijuana. It could be credit cards. It could be a, a variety of issues, marijuana being one of them. 
And uh, so have you reviewed the Department of Investigation's report on the correlation between uh, marijuana, low-level offenses, and violent crime? And, 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 and I think the Department, uh, Mark Peters' report certainly stated that there is really no correlation. There may be some parts, you know, related, but marijuana arrests have very little to do uh, with violent crime. Um, so I just want to hear your thoughts a little bit more on that. Have you reviewed that particular report as well? I am not positive I, if I've reviewed that. Um. Are you talking about the one from two years ago? Say it again. Two years ago? Yes. Yeah, I've certainly read a lot of literature for various reports, but I don't want to give you a false answer that that particular report I've read. Um, my, my comments on it would be, uh, respectfully, there are times that there is uh, somewhat of a, uh, a correlation. Um, and that's not to say that I disagree with the overall premise of the report. Um, but there are, there are times where um, marijuana use is linked to individual cases where we have seen violence. So can you go through, and so this is really why we're here today. So how many arrests were there last year, and, or if you want to combine all three years uh, related to marijuana? Marijuana related? Yes. So, or can you lay out between 14, 15, 16, 17? So 14, uh, misdemeanor, so this would categorize the 221.10 um, arrests, roughly 26,000, dropping in 15 to 16,000. In 16, it's up to 17,000. And then in 17, um, 17,000. Um, 17,000 arrests. 17,500. I, I, if, you, if we're... So the Some, number went up? It went up from 15 to 16 by about 1,100. And uh, in 17, it went down about 100. It's, it's, when, you look at the, when you look at a longer period of time, you could make the argument that the last couple years have somewhat... Um, so the administration did commit leveled. to minimizing or, or decreasing the amount of arrests related to marijuana, correct? That's correct. And so when you look at 2013, which is just four years ago, 29,000 arrests. When right. you go to 2014, it's reduced to 26,000. Right. When you go to 2015, it's down another 10,000 to 16,000. But the last three years and the beginning of this year to start, it has somewhat uh, leveled off. And where are most of these arrests occurring? And can you go through uh, any demographic information you have on uh, where majority of these marijuana well, well, arrests are occurring? In terms of demographics, mm -hmm. um, I don't have in front of me by boroughs. I can give you the top 15 commands. Um, okay. 2 5 Precinct, which is East Harlem, 40th Precinct, which is in the South Bronx, the 2 3, again, East Harlem the 4-3 precinct in the Bronx, the 4-2 in the Bronx, the 4-4 in the Bronx, the 4-9 in the Bronx. Then you get Coney Island in the 6-0, the 7-0 in Brooklyn, Washington Heights, the 3-4, the 102 in Queens, Bed-Stuy in the 7 2 is uh, what neighborhood in Queens? I'm sorry? What, which neighborhood is that in Queens? The 102 precinct. Uh, which, which area is that? It's okay, you could let yeah, me yeah, hook that up and get that back to me. 7 3 in Bed Stuy, the 5 2, the 114, which is Astoria, Queens, and then the 5th, which is essentially right here. Okay. That's and, the top and 15. What, and so, there, so, very grateful for you uh, reading off the, the, the precincts. What do all those precincts have in common? Yeah, well, I could tell you that what we see in terms of where we make the majority of our arrests are where we get, we tend to get the most complaints. And I'm basing that on both 9-11 complaints, 311 complaints, and then complaints that are not memorialized, but also we're getting complaints in from community meetings. So, so only, so 
if I'm hearing you right, you're receiving. And so we did ask you to sort of desegregate this information to the committee uh, sometime last week. So I'm interested in sort of do you have a breakdown uh, in particular where these 911 and 311 calls are being made from? Yeah. What we and can you do it, break it down by command or neighborhood? So when, when you look at the marijuana arrests that we make, not arrest. I just I want you to focus on the calls. But there is there is a correlation. Okay. So we okay. make the arrests. When you look at the top commands where arrests are made, and you overlay that with the top commands where either we get the most complaints, or we have a spike in recent activity and complaints, they overlay. That that's where we tend to make and deploy officers. But I don't have that information in front of me. So. So I, I hear what you're saying, but that information should have been given to the committee, to the respective committees uh, on the 911 data specifically broken down in a way that we can dissect it and make that correlation. But I, I, I'm not saying I don't trust your word, but it would have been good to have that information so, today. So the issue with and, and where the arrests are made I believe, are where the complaints are. But what you run into is an imperfect science in trying to determine the calls that are specifically related to marijuana. And I'll elaborate. So, so let's Wait. go through, uh, sorry to cut you off here, but let's go through marijuana use. Uh, and these are stats um, uh, that have been based on uh, from 2002 to, to 15. So, uh, ever use marijuana in your life? Uh, so I'll start uh, 2011. Uh, around 33% of whites have uh, acknowledged they've used marijuana in the past. Around 32% uh, blacks have uh, acknowledged the use of marijuana within the past year of there. Uh, Latinos, around 27 percent, uh, have acknowledged they've used marijuana uh, at least prior in a year. So when we break down the use of marijuana, are we just, uh, does the, uh, are blacks the only ones smoking marijuana and Latinos in New York City is the question. And if we look at the use of marijuana, it's pretty even when you look at across the spectrum of marijuana use uh, in our city. So the question is, why is so much of the enforcement uh, in communities of color? So when you first started quoting the statistics about use, I think it was 33 percent white. I think we need to concentrate for a second on the word use. I'm not disputing those numbers. Uh, in, in 2014, when we revisited our policy most recently, and, and we made a significant uh, allowance or, or differentiated between use and burning, um, I don't know the numbers I have no reason to dispute those numbers right. that I and, just and, heard. And, and, but, uh, but when we hmm. are making arrests for marijuana 22110 in New York City, it, it's 90 percent of those arrests that we are making, and we made the attempt, and we did cut the arrests, and we saw an increase in summonses to try to right. do that. And I, and and, I definitely and understand that. that. But, but when 90 percent of the arrests that we make Right. Or for burning, and that's what the differentiation. But is communities here. of color are not the only ones burning. So, in when you look at the percentage of marijuana arrests between blacks and Latinos, when in 2016, 85 percent of arrests were of black and Latino people of the city, 15 percent uh, of white and all others. When you look at 2011 under the Bloomberg administration, 84% of people targeted for marijuana arrests were black and Latinos, 16% were white and others. So if the administration is serious about changing this disparity, we're not seeing it. 
Well, it's twofold. We, we've, since 2011. Would you disagree that there's still disparities, huge disparities that exist when it comes to marijuana arrests in the city? No, I would not disagree. Uh, and the, when you look at 2011, um, we have cut 65% of the arrests that we've made. The remaining arrests that we make now, again, are overlaid exactly in the parts of the city where we are receiving complaints from the public about specifically, and, and it's not marijuana use, it, it's marijuana burning, and it's marijuana burning in public view. And, and that's the distinction. And let me, uh, so we have this opioid issue going on now. How many arrests have occurred over the opioid uh, issue? So, uh, so can you go through 2016, 2017, 2015? Yeah, I cannot. Uh, I can certainly get you those numbers. For the opioids, low-level possessions, we'd be talking about Penal Law Section 220.03. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you talk about the opiate issue, specifically the last couple years where we have seen, um, at times, 50 percent increases in non-fatal overdoses, we have also seen significant cuts in the arrests being made uh, by the New York City Police Department for those types of offenses. Right. But I'm interested, and you don't have those numbers. Is there no way to get those numbers um, while you're here? So I'm interested in knowing how many people were arrested over that, over opioids, compared to marijuana, and where is, are, where's the breakdown uh, there as well? I'm not sure I understand the question. So I'm trying to make a comparison. Yep. I want to know how many people, because that is a huge crisis, 1,600 deaths due to, mar uh, to opioids last year, correct? Yes. And how many deaths related to marijuana? Uh, so when you, when you compare the opioids to the marijuana, uh, um, I don't you can get where I'm going. I'm trying to make a correlation. I understand the here. point you're trying to make. I'm interested in what we, we have done. Enforcement looks like there as well. Well, we have enforcement, but we're talking about two completely separate issues. Um, with the opiates, it's probably, you know, I have 27 years with the New York City Police Department in a couple months. It's probably the most complicated issue that I have seen. Um, what we are doing in terms of opiates and trying to, at the same time, interdict, same time, also trying to branch out and go further um, than we ever have before in trying to identify people with substance abuse, try to get them in treatment that works, work with our partners in the criminal justice system and outside the criminal justice system. Um, and, and we are far from succeeding in this area. But uh, I would not draw comparisons uh, personally, between the opiate problem and the marijuana problem. And how many uh, marijuana arrests have led to violation of probation? And currently, how many people are on Rikers due to marijuana arrests? I don't have that data, but I would suspect it is, uh, if you're talking 22110, the A misdemeanor, I would suspect that that number would be near zero, absent other factors. And when I say other factors, perhaps a parole violation or wanted for other crimes. Right, but I'm interested in that. Yeah. So I'm interested in how many people have, are back on the island due to marijuana arrests that may, that may be, uh, revolve around parole, probation. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have that information. But strictly for a marijuana arrest, um, again, I would say that it's near zero. A marijuana arrest does not generally uh, result in somebody being sent to Rikers Island. Are marijuana arrests tied to any federal grants, such as the Edward Byrne grant? Um, it, so marijuana is not tied to any federal dollars that come down? Not that I'm aware of. Do you support the current bill that Councilmember Levin uh, has introduced? Uh, 
Sure, Council Member. We, uh, we look forward to working with uh, Council Member Levin as we did with the Council during the last term on uh, dozens of uh, reporting bills and furtherance of transparency. And uh, I'm sure we'll find uh, the right recipe uh, for the bill, but we don't oppose the bill. And you do understand why we have to pass such legislation? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I understand. Uh, I also want to highlight that during the last uh, council term, during the last four-year term, together we've worked on dozens of reporting bills in furtherance of transparency. The department, on its own initiative, uh, posts public data in the form of ComStat 2.0, traffic stat, and the like. So we've, uh, we're probably the most transparent we've ever been as a department, as an administration, and we look forward to working with you in furtherance, in furtherance of transparency moving forward. Um, so I'm going to go to my colleague for question, but let me just say this. Um, these numbers don't show we're making progress, and, and I do want to say yes, the rest have gone down, and, and obviously there's been progress on the summonses. However, the disparity of where these summonses and arrests are still occurring uh, is not transformational. Um, it doesn't show that the department is really serious about addressing disparities in communities of color. Um, marijuana should not be a life sentence for anyone. Um, and many of our young black and brown men and women who are still being accosted and still giving these summonses over petty marijuana summonses when other cities are looking to legalize marijuana at this point uh, is a disgrace. And we have a long way uh, to go uh, to ensure that we correct this. So this is the reason we want to see the data. I don't think you really came here uh, specifically with some of the information that we requested. Uh, we will be following up, especially on the 911 calls, because uh, I refuse to believe that in New York City, a city of eight million, eight and a half million people, that the only individuals calling 911 or 311 around this issue are people in communities of color. You can walk around City Hall some days and walk through the park and you will smell marijuana being burned. So there's a bigger question here and a bigger systematic issue that uh, we have to address. Uh, because our young people deserve better. It should not be a life sentence uh, for them, uh, especially when marijuana use is common amongst everyone. Uh, I will go to Councilmember Lanceman for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Chairman of the Public Safety Committee is maybe more of a gentleman or, or kinder than I am. Um, I find your testimony and the entire performance this morning to be deeply troubling. And it starts with the fact that rooted in your defense of the grotesque disparities that exist between uh, marijuana enforcement of people of color um, and white people is the um, uh, uh, s uh, belief and statement that marijuana enforcement in the city is driven by 311 calls, or at least the 311 calls will demonstrate that the communities of color where marijuana enforcement is prevalent um, are calling the city saying, come and help us with our drug problem, and that is what's driving the enforcement in community of, communities of color versus other communities. Uh, in and of itself, that the department has not looked at those disparities, something like, to, to be generous, maybe 85 percent of the people who are arrested for marijuana possession are, are uh, black or Latino. Um, even just relying on the 311 data, when confronted with such an extraordinary disparity, is troubling. But we asked the department to produce that information 
that 311 data, the data that we've heard Commissioner Bratton talk about, the data that you yourself this morning testified to, and did not receive it either before the hearing or, or at the hearing. We have emails to the department from the, begin, from the middle of February asking for this information because we know that this is how the department justifies this um, otherwise seemingly unjustifiable disparity. Uh, and, and the enforcement throughout the city is wildly uneven. I, I'll give you an example. Um, this is from a, a, a story by a reporter um, last February. The toughest place to smoke weed in New York City, the Councilman's District. It's the toughest place to toke in New York City. A cluster of neighborhoods on the Queens and Nassau border have received the most pot summonses in the Big Apple for nine of the past 10 years, NYPD records show. And it's thanks largely to Lieutenant so-and-so, the boss of the narcotics and anti-crime teams for the last nine years at the 105th Precinct, who's been offering incentives to ticket pot smokers and other quality of life scoff laws, sources told the Post. It's clearly working. Cops in the 105th Precinct, which covers parts of Queens Village, Cambria Heights, Laurelton, Rosedale, and Springfield Gardens, wrote, 1,851 tickets for pot possession last year, that would have been 2016, the most among the city's 77 precincts, and a hefty 9% of the citywide total. Now those are not poor neighborhoods. They are not, euphemistically speaking, uh, challenging neighborhoods. These are solid middle class communities. And your response essentially for why communities like those in South Queens and, and others, large day of color, are so heavily targeted for marijuana enforcement is because, well, those communities are calling 311 and complaining about marijuana use or drug use. And then you can't produce at this hearing any documentation to support that assertion. Now, you clearly have that documentation. I assume that you're not pulling it out of thin air, I hope, but you're not producing it to the council. I recall being at the police academy for some big briefing that Commissioner Bratton was giving. It had to do with broken windows enforcement. And he had put up on a map um, a, 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 like circles around neighborhoods where 311 calls came in and where arrests were made. And the map clearly showed that there was not a correlation. Mm -hmm. I recall, not to single out any of my colleagues' districts, but the Upper East Side, the Financial District, Bay Ridge, sorry. Um, <laughs> there were plenty of 311 calls, but there were not the similar number of arrests. So you, forgive me if I'm a little more direct than my colleague. Until you show me the information, until you produce the data that we requested, that shows, in fact, that there is a correlation between 311 calls, whether it's 311 call for marijuana specifically or 311 call because there's, there's, there's drug use on my corner, I just cannot accept that that is the justification for this incredible disparity. It's obvious that on a precinct by precinct basis, commanders are making decisions about what to enforce more strictly and, 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 and how to do that. And I'm going to ask the chair, at the conclusion of this hearing, when you bang the gavel down, rather than to conclude the hearing, how about we adjourn it, we get the information that we know exists because you're relying on it, and then we consider reconvening so we can have a real conversation based on the data and the justifications that you are providing to us. With that said, are there any other policing reasons that there would be such an extraordinary um, uh, um, um, impact on communities of color? Why 85%, 90% of the people arrested for marijuana possession are black and Latino? That might be explained by something other than 
where the 311 calls are coming in? So a couple things. Um, I agree with everything that you just said. Um, when, you, when you spoke about Commissioner Bratton putting up charts, I don't remember those particular charts, but I would have been involved in that process. But, it, but that would have probably been 2014 or 15, and then talking about data from a year ago. I remind the, the numbers, since 2013, we've cut almost 40% the number of arrests that we've made. So if the 311 calls that you recall did not match up at that time, I'm not disputing that. But what I did start out today and say, when we look at, and it's much more 911 calls than 311 calls, because the 311 calls are dwarfed in comparison to the okay. number of 911 calls. Just for the record, e either way, you've provided us with neither 311 nor 911 data. Agreed. No one is more frustrated than me, and that is continuing to this day. When you talk about analyzing these calls, and let me just, I'll try to do it briefly and show you what we are up against. But there is no magic button for the NYPD to push to say, give me a report which gives you what you want. Marijuana, spelled 15 different ways. Weed, pot, the calls about kids smoking in front of my building. Are they smoking? or are they smoking marijuana? We have to infer from that. And we do not like to give data that we cannot stand by. I, I understand that, I do. And, and, so and the I, numbers I'm quoting to you, I'm gonna tell you that I am troubled by what I see, hmm. and we have seen significant jumps in the number of calls regarding marijuana use, and it coincides with the drop in arrests that we have made. And that is something that we constantly need to balance out when we look at the totality of New York City conditions. I also have the re responsibility to be responsive to the woman walking into her building with her kids that has to walk by sometimes three people smoking marijuana and or shooting dice or a number of other things. The, the numbers that you quoted, the 85% or the 90%, clearly that's troubling and it should be troubling to anyone, including me, but it's in the under the umbrella of we have worked significantly the last four years to where responsible and carefully cut arrests while balancing out the overall public safety of New York City. And I think we've done very well. Yeah. We are not done. Yeah. No, no, listen, I, I get the challenges in all the different ways that marijuana is spelled and, and all of that, and I don't, I'm not trivializing it. It's just that it's you, you and your testimony today, you, the NYPD, that's telling us, well, here's why we're making all these arrests in these communities, because we're getting 311 and 911 calls in those communities. I assume, again, that, that you're not, you know, just pulling that out of thin air. I assume you're relying on, on data. So the data's there. We want to see it. But we the data is far from perfect, and that's where there, there are reservations about if you ask three different people, you could have three different interpretations, and neither of them are wrong, but neither of them are 100% clear. Got it, so, clear. So, so the data may be shaky. So that's why I asked, is there a reason, as a policing professional, is it 27 years on the force? Yes, sir. Yeah, three stars on each shoulder? That's, that's, that's like pretty impressive, right? You are the dun, 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 chief of crime control strategies for the NYPD. You're a really important guy. Can you tell us what reason there might be for this extraordinary disparity other than the three one, where the 311 and 911 calls are coming from? Because that, that information, as you said, you know, may be shaky and you may get three different people looking at it and giving you three different answers. Are there any other reasons no, that... The, the main reason is the responsiveness to complaints that are coming in. And that's categorized by what you just hit on, 311, 911. It's also community complaints. We're in the midst of the last couple of years trying to, and quite successfully, initially, revolutionize how we police New York City. Um, the neighborhood policing effort that's well underway. That, uh, let me, let me uh, to build the block meetings. So a variety of ways people are coming. We are being responsive to complaints that are coming to us. 
and it would be negligent for us to ignore those complaints. There was, okay. you ha mentioned have you given any consideration, right? If I am in your shoes and I see this 85, 90 percent, you know, people of color, and as the chairman indicated, and we all have seen, it's accepted yes. conventional wisdom that blacks and whites smoke marijuana or possess marijuana at similar rates. If, if, I, if I saw that, I would ask, are there any other factors that might be involved? For example, um, we know that, that inequality permeates the criminal justice system. I don't think there's any dispute about that. And I give the administration and mayor credit um, for acknowledging that and trying to work with the council on a whole host of measures relating to the criminal justice system. And, and I know that the, the, the department, I think, is finally starting its implicit bias training. Mm -hmm. Have you given consideration to the fact that, that there may be bias in the department as to where it is enforcing uh, the marijuana, law, what marijuana laws, like separate from where it's getting those, those calls? Is, is this aspect of, of the criminal justice system the only one that is, any, that is free from, from the kind of bias and discrimination that we see in other aspects of the criminal justice system? And if it's not, like, what are we doing about that? So uh, we went to great lengths in 2014 when we revised our policy. I believe this was done, I, I have Susan mm -hmm. sitting next to me, in 2014 to try to advertise what we were doing, given out to the public, posted on social media. And, and mm -hmm. on the front is self-explanatory, but then it goes into great detail on the back different ways that you can possess marijuana and differentiating it with burning and smoking in public view and telling people it's not a license to smoke outside. If you do the following, you would still be subject to arrest. Um, outside of that, sir, when, when you, you, you also have to be aware, as I, I know you are, that deployment issues come into effect here. What uh, issues? Deployment issues. Mm -hmm. um, who uses marijuana more, who uses marijuana and smokes it outside. I don't have the answers to those questions demographically or racially broken down. But could it be a factor that uh, individuals of whatever race in a particular part of the city are, are smoking marijuana? If there's not an officer there, I, I, let me be clear. It, when we deploy our officers and the officers are there, no matter what race that person is, if the people are smoking marijuana outside, we expect them to enforce the existing law. Are you confident sitting here today that officers in white neighborhoods are in fact enforcing the law with the same uh, 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 vigor and um, uh, 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 zeal as they are in communities of color? That 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 is why. That the reason that there's such a disproportionate amount of enforcement in communities of color versus white communities is, in fact, because of the neutral application of the law, and that officers in white communities aren't a little more forgiving and giving a warning or or looking the other way. I, I have no evidence to suggest that officers in white communities are enforcing the law any differently than they are in, in neighborhoods of color. All right, let me, just two more questions. <clears throat> one is, at the, the CompStat meetings, when, when you see a precinct like the 105th with marijuana arrests kind of off the charts or, or significant deviation from the norm, is it part of the CompStat conversation in addition to, hey, how come there are more burglaries and how come there are more rapes? Why are your marijuana arrests so unusually high? Big of the pun. So, so hypothetically, and, and the 105, as I look, is not in the top 15 of arrests made. So that, that might have been last year, it might have been summonses, perhaps. I think it was why. referring to 2016 data. Okay. It's still, this is a, a black 
middle class neighborhood that shouldn't even be on the list technically. So, so when is that something that could be looked at? Absolutely, uh, during the Comstat process. Right, but, but no, but but is it? Is it like in Com like in Comstat? You going through? I understand primarily you're going through. Okay, you're having more burglaries, rapes, whatever the case might be in a particular precinct. Are you also measuring each command's performance? in terms of its adherence to the mayor's 2014 policy and flagging numbers that may, may indicate that this particular command is not adhering to that, that policy or is um, really unusually and overzealously enforcing uh, marijuana possession. Like, like is there anything at that Comstat meeting where, where, where this, this CO would have showed up and somebody would say, why are your marijuana arrests or summonses, why is your marijuana enforcement just like off the charts? Yeah, that, that's absolutely something that could be discussed at a particular Comstat meeting uh, and very likely would be uh, looked at well before any Comstat meeting by a number of units within the New York City Police Department. Mm -hmm. um, the Comstat meetings tend to focus on current crime conditions that are going on in the particular area uh, and, and how the precinct commanders and the borough commanders and the different units are utilizing the resources available to them to address those conditions. Um, arrests are, are one part of what would be analyzed, looked at, and discussed, but again, it would not um, only be looked at during the Comstat process. Got it. All right, and my last um, question relates to the interaction between the PD and the district attorneys. As I think you know, both the Manhattan District Attorney and the Brooklyn District Attorney have announced their own, you know, say marijuana policies. At the time that I think it was Manhattan that announced that its office, that office's policies, there was some, some uh, disconnect that the NYPD seemed to be saying, well, you may not be choosing to prosecute certain of these cases, but we're bringing to you, them to you anyway. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, synchronization Mm -hmm. between the NYPD, the arrests that you're making, the, the people and cases that you're bringing to the DAs, particularly in Manhattan and Brooklyn, with, with their, their own policies? Or are you just doing your thing, dropping the people off with the DA's office, figuratively speaking, and then from there it's up to them? So, so we're in the unique position in New York City that we have five local elected district attorneys. We have the Southern District, the Eastern District. We have the citywide special narcotics port. So that's part. So that's up to eight separate prosecutors offices. I can tell you that we collaborate closely with all eight uh, on a variety of issues. And we would not be where we are today in New York City with the success, success of pushing crime down without that collaboration. Um, do we see eye to eye on every single issue? I would be lying if I told you yes, but I think that uh, on the vast majority and the vast, vast majority of issues, we are in agreement. Uh, we are always looking to uh, improve the process of uh, law enforcement and public safety in New, in New York City, but we don't hold as a unique metric uh, what is going to happen to an arrest as a deciding factor in on all these issues or whether or not we are going to make that arrest. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a balance, if you will, of uh, individual, every uh, crime type is probably unique in this matter. But um, again, overall, I think the, the relationship between the New York City Police Department and the different prosecutors in New York City, I would describe it as very healthy. I appreciate that, and that's a, a general response to my question, so perhaps I wasn't specific enough, so let me do it again. Both the Manhattan DA's office and the Brooklyn DA's office have their own unique marijuana prosecution policies. I, is there any policy or practice with the NYPD in terms of the arrests for marijuana possession that you make in those jurisdictions that tries to, to synchronize with the prosecution policies of those district attorney's offices? Cause, I, I would, or, or are you just 
You know, it's one citywide policy from the NYPD's perspective, and, and you're arresting people um, and bring them to the DA's office despite the fact that on the face of the DA's policy, they're not prosecuting that case. I think they are prosecuting the case. They may be making a strategic decision to offer, for example, a, a, an ACD, an, an adjournment, but that is, in effect, a prosecution. I think we are uh, uh, in agreement with the prosecutors. When we, when in, I can recall sitting around a table with prosecutors in 2014 uh, and having uh, give and take and discussions uh, about when we crafted that marijuana policy that the NYPD employs right now. So uh, if I'm mistaken about a point, I'm sure you'll bring it to my attention. But uh, the, the arrests that we make are, are um, prosecuted. Again, we, we, we are not always lockstep, uh, but I think that we have a very healthy relationship. We've also, at the same time, pushed crime down and cut about 100 and, close to 140,000 arrests since 2010. We're also, at the same time, diverting many, and that's done with co collaboration with the different prosecutors, whether it's adults or juveniles. And we look forward to the Change the Age, which is also going to divert even more uh, arrests of 16, 17-year-olds coming up to family court. So again, um, all of this is done, not in a vacuum, but in a balance of public safety and how to keep New York City citizens safe and make it even safer as we go forward. And it's challenging. But we look forward to, uh, you know, continuing our good collaboration with the prosecutors. Thank you, All right. Um, thank you. I think that there is a disconnect between the NYPD and, and the prosecution practices of those offices. Um, we'll maybe get an opportunity to have that fleshed out when, when the public defenders testify. Um, if you want to whisper to him and he wants to say something, I'd be happy to hear it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just still not clear on what, what you believe the disconnect is. Yeah. Sure. Can, you, can you say what you think it is? Well, the DA's offices have said that they're not going to prosecute in certain circumstances, and the PD is still sending defendants their way, even though the PD knows that based on the articulated policy. Marijuana? What's or that? Are, are you referring to the, yeah, the turnstile No, no, not turnstile. That's, that's, that's another day. Yep. Marijuana, yeah. So, so, I mean, when we, when we crafted our policy in 2014, I can think, you know, off the top of my head with, uh, you know, discussions back and forth with Brooklyn, Brooklyn uh, prosecutor at the time, and, uh, you know, discussions about uh, is it around a school, is it at a park, is it burning? And, and this was done in collaboration. Um, again, arrests that are made when the law is enforced in New York City now we're not turning a blind eye and saying we don't care what happens once it hits the prosecutor, but there's reasonable expectations, too. Um, individuals are not going to Rikers Island for being arrested for 22110. Yeah. It may be that there are other extraneous circumstances that are wanted for a rape. They are currently on probation and not complying with a variety of things. That is all certainly possible, but... Um, you know, the NYPD does not have an expectation, for example, that somebody arrested for smoking a marijuana cigarette is, is going to receive X sentence. That's just unrealistic. And I think we're, we're uh, very much so in lockstep with the prosecutors. Right. Well, we'll... We can expand on that. We'll expand on that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Just a few more questions, and I'm going to go to my colleagues. Um, what is the NYPD's uh, position on um, the legalization of marijuana? Do you have one? I, I do not have a position on, on uh, the legalization of marijuana. Um, you know, we will enforce, we'll continue to enforce the, the laws that are uh, active and on the books, and um, anything, anything that comes past that we will deal with. And you are familiar uh, that the governor, I believe, has convened a task force to look at legalization of marijuana? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, have you looked at other cities that have legalized marijuana? Have you seen, have you looked at their crime trends, and can you speak to that? Have they seen big upticks in crime? As recently as uh, last month, I was at a conference and uh, that is a topic that 
comes up quite often. Marijuana does. The, the legalization the of marijuana and the impact that it has uh, positively or negatively or not at all on crime rates. Uh, I don't believe there is enough data yet. I know that there are a number of studies, but I can tell you firsthand that uh, from uh, police chiefs in Colorado that I've spoken to, police chiefs in different cities in California, um, there are still to this day concerns. Um, I'll give you some examples. Uh, the impact it may have on individuals driving or believing that it's safer to drive after consuming marijuana, uh, that, that, that does worry me. Um, it may be something that's legal, but think of alcohol. It's still not legal to drink under the influence of alcohol, and is that going to have an but impact? But have they seen upticks in deaths due to marijuana? I believe there are articles citing that, yes. Articles or facts? Articles, and, and okay. I, like you, am very suspect of things I read. I, I don't. I don't agree with Reagan on much, as Oleg knows. But we like to trust and verify. <laughs> I think there's also. Probably don't agree with him on There's also. Uh, um, you know, I'll just go and and then just these last facts because this will put it all in perspective. And I I know we beat the drum a lot on this, and, and rightfully so. Uh, so I'm just going to read through these, and then we're going to get the question. In Queens, no offense to any of my colleagues, please don't hold it against me. In Bayside, blacks and Latinos are 12% of the population and 52% of the arrests for marijuana possession. In Forest Hills, they are 16% of residents and 80% of the marijuana arrests. In Flushing, they are 19% of residents, but 71% of those are arrested for marijuana. In Ridgewood, they're blacks and Latinos, 36% of the population, but 83% of the arrest. Let's go to Brooklyn. In Chiefs Head Bay, Bay blacks and Latinos are 12% of the population and make up 50% of the marijuana arrests. In Borough Park, they are 15% of residents and 57% of people arrested for marijuana. In Greenpoint, they are 19% of the population and 70% of the arrest. In Park Slope, you know who lives from Park Slope. Blacks and Latinos are 24% of the residents and 73% of the people arrested for marijuana. And in Williamsburg, blacks and Latinos are 37% of the residents, but make up 83% of arrests on marijuana. I rest my case. We will go to questions. All right, and I will acknowledge Council Members Mizell, Rodriguez, Barron, uh, uh, Hayam Deutsch and Miller, and we will go to questions now. We'll go start with Councilmember Cohen, followed by him, Cabrera, and then Vallone. Councilmember Cohen for questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I appreciate, uh, you know, the truth is, uh, as the hearing went on, uh, my questions, I think, were resolved. I, I think that it's really a very, very poor use of NYPD resources. It's divisive uh, to, to, for these, to make these arrests. I'm not even sure about the summonses, I don't, you know, and I'm not sh convinced that there's any correlation between burning and crime uh, or, you know, other crimes. Uh, so I really, I think that, that this is, you know, it's wrong-headed. I think the, the, the statistics cited by the chair, you know, whether it's uh, discriminatory in intent, it's certainly discriminatory in effect, the enforcement. Uh, if it were, if this was the state legislature as opposed to city council, I would be very eager to do something to change the laws to make this uh, not be the law of the state of New York. Uh, so I don't have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We're now going to go to Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you so much uh, to both of the chair, Chief. Welcome, and thank you for all you do. Um, I, I'm going to take a diff different position here. Uh, people in my community, uh, when they call 311-911, uh, they want a response. They want, they want the NYPD to show up. Uh, when I first came uh, back to New York, I was born in New York, and I came back when I was 25, uh, you know, I had somebody who decided to smoke pot every single day. I had little children, and that was disturbing to me. Uh, many people in my community, they're disturbed when they're outside, they're hanging out, and they're smoking pot outside, and they don't want to, you know, they don't want to be smelling 
uh, what's going on. So I, I can't speak for the other neighborhood, and I understand that there's a big disparity on the numbers. My neighborhood is 99% minority, uh, so I, I don't have that disparity in numbers, uh, and we do need to look at that, but I, 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 the law is the law, and when you're called upon to enforce the law, you know, that's what it is. So for my neighborhood, I, I would say I keep doing uh, the work. I'm not for legalizing marijuana. Uh, I, the numbers are clear in Colorado and the other states that we do have more accidents. Uh, so we saw people smoking uh, marijuana. I, I don't want to be driving. I, it's bad enough that we're dealing with people who are under the influence of alcohol. Uh, I don't want anybody I know to be part of uh, a higher statistics of, of vehicular uh, accidents or result of another uh, influence uh, taking place. I, I mean to ask you though, because the question uh, was brought about the opiates, is it uh, that we see lower numbers because it's, it's less visible? I mean, we're talking mostly pills, uh, so it's harder, uh, it's easier to conceal. Uh, and even to, uh, you know, it's not as visible. Is, it, would you accrue that to uh, the disparity and numbers uh, in comparison to marijuana arrests? Yeah, I apologize. I, I wasn't told that opiates were its topic, so that's why I didn't have those numbers. Um, very, very different on many levels. That's a great point that... Uh, you know, again, when, when we talk of the disparity in marijuana possessions, we use the word possession because that's the title of the criminal procedure law, 22110, criminal possession of marijuana. But within that, there is a subdivision of burning and burning in open view. So that, that seems to be at the crux of why... Um, the majority of these arrests are made. Uh, the most recent data that I have, it's, it's almost 90% of the arrests for criminal possession of marijuana actually is burning in public. So th that is at the heart of what we are talking about here. A and you're right, we just don't see, thankfully, um, 220.03, which is the criminal possession of a controlled substance, with the same... With the same uh, fact pattern. People are not shooting up in a park on a corner with the same frequency. Sorry, Chief, I run out of time, but uh, I have more questions, but maybe later on. Thank you. Uh, Valone, followed by Valone, will be Councilmember Rose and then Barron. Thank you to both. Thank you to the chairs. Thank you to the department. So in 2018, how does somebody get arrested today for a marijuana offense? What, is, this, what is the policy today for the NYPD? It's the same that it's been since, uh, I would say, mid-2014. Criminal possession of marijuana, 221.10. Um, if, you, if you have marijuana and you are smoking a marijuana cigarette outside in public, you are going to be arrested. That's, the, that's nearly 9 of 10 arrests that we make. When you segregate out now and you look at the remaining 10% of the arrests, those are not the smoking. They're in a small amount of marijuana, but then you have to remember that you have people that are wanted for other crimes. They may not have identification on them, et cetera. Uh, so, I s so sticking to that, so you said there was a 65% drop since 2014. Since the end of 2013, So yep. it's the new policy. And now 9 out of 10 of those arrests since that, of that 65% fall in the burning of the marijuana class. We, we didn't have the ability to answer that question uh, prior really to last year. 221.10, penal law, criminal possession of marijuana. You can, it's, there's a couple subdivisions, and it's possess marijuana in public, and then there's one with the burning. And All right, so since we're on the clock after sorry, listening to an hour my and time, hand, not yours, let sorry. Me, so of that, there's another policy that where if there's an intent to sell or the individual has an outstanding warrant or the burning is by a school, so do you have classifications on where, if someone is smoking or burning marijuana, where those arrests are made? Or is it just going to be on a stoop? Is there a breakdown of, like, if there's, because most of there the There is calls, not a breakdown. Well, that should be part of it, because if the calls are coming for around That's schools, the penal law, though. That's not policy. The penal law states, 
burning in public. But then the administration's policy added that clause in 2014 that the NYPD has been following. So part of the breakdown and the reduction in the 65% is including these very few remaining classifications. So I think that's important that the, the, the amount of arrests that are being made are being used for very limited purposes, not just for the burning, but also for intent to sell and by the schools. That's a very small number of the totality. Nine of 10 arrests that we make are for burning, and that was a conscious decision uh, that we crafted in 2014 that we of the Of the arrests that are made, how many determine or show outstanding warrants? I don't have that number in front of me. Do you have an idea for whether it's less than 50 percent, more than 50 percent? I would say it's definitely less than 50 percent. Well, that's part of the tools that we try to determine whether a crime and keeping the safety of New York City is whether we can put to, to get behind bars those who have an outstanding warrant, whether it's jumping a turnstile, whether it's smoking marijuana, something of the lesser quality of life. If we remove those crimes, what will that do for the remainder of the public safety? Understood, but we're balancing that out with uh, with what Councilman Cabrera mentioned, and, and other states that have legalized are struggling with this now. Um, what do we do when people are complaining to the police department about the people on their block with the, when they're bringing their kids to the park and there's people smoking marijuana? And this is uh, not, an easy, not an easy problem, but that is a real problem. I could tell you that I would be, I would be negligent if I didn't, wasn't critical of our officers during the ComStat process and beyond, that we are not being responsive to people. We have situations where people are calling up and, and you feel very bad for them because they're saying, this is the fifth time I've called, this is the tenth time I've called. Please do something, NYPD. Why are you not addressing our concerns? Well, I think so that's I the totality. I join, I'll end it just by saying I join. I think that data would be very important for all of us. If, if, if what you're saying is true, it, oh, really it, is changes, true. it really changes the context of the hearing. If you don't have the data to back that up, then it changes the following questions for that. Because if there are calls being made in by neighborhoods that are not being followed up, why? And if there are just one call being made in a particular neighborhood and cops are being sent out, why is that happening? So I think in, in fairness to that, I, I would like to see that data too, because it would change. It would actually help or hurt based on what's happening. But thank you, Chairs, for the hearing. And I thank the council member. Thank you. Thank you for those points. And council member Lan Lanceman just raised a good point. In the 105 over 1,800 uh, summonses uh, in 2016, right? You would think people are just home all day, just calling 311 and 911 about marijuana. And this is a working class neighborhood. So we refuse to believe people are just home all day, just we smell marijuana. You know, middle class homeowners, we're not even talking about developments. This is a stronghold middle class neighborhood. So. There's, disparities there's, are not adding there's up. always there are always outliers uh, and right. there is chronic conditions that have to be revisited and complaints I'll tell you that when you go to a complaint when you go excuse me to a community meeting uh, and, and I've commanded several precincts in my time um, it's it's generally what you hear is we want more police we want to address but, these conditions, whether it's noise, double parking, or sometimes issues but like this. But in all fairness, and I'll just say this, if you went to the 105 today and you walked down the block, you're not seeing gangs of people just walking up and down blocks smoking marijuana. It's just, it's not a reality. So uh, it's not adding up. Uh, We'll go to Councilmember Rose, followed by Rose Barron. Can I just add one thing? They're not getting summonses for public burning. Nobody's getting a summons for public burning. Yeah, we'll put you, so you're going to, yeah, we'll just swear her in. Okay. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer honestly to council member questions in your testimony? I do. Yes, ma'am. So if they're getting summonses in the 105, it's not for public burning. Nobody's getting a summons for public burning. They're getting arrested for public burning. Right. So, so, so let's so, so since we're on the 105, inside. can you go through the 105's numbers? No, well, we have because to if you just give me one second, I'll. Uh, okay, 105. Arrest for summonses. Sixty-one arrests. 
This year. 2016. 61 arrests. In 2017, 50 arrests. Okay. And on summonses? And that's summonses, the 105. 1,851 in 2016, and that's in 2017, 2,199. You're killing us. An increase of 18.8%. So you get our point now. It's not public burning, that's what I want. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether they're burning or not. Right, but you're, but he's saying he's getting a 311 and 911 report based on people burning. So I'm going off of what he said. So the 911 calls. Otherwise, why are there 1,851 summonses in 2,100 in 2017? No, no one's calling and saying, hey, there's someone outside my house with a marijuana <laughs> joint in their pocket, which I can't <laughs> see or smell. This is not. I know it's there. The, the 911. Unless calls. there's just a person sitting home all day making these calls it's just it shows the and the enforcement is uneven the 911 calls in the 105 precinct are up 18% year over year and why is that and the 311 calls are up very small numbers but 169% the 105 is a very big precinct so yes, without the, the segregating the information it's hard to make a calculation the 105 Cover the same lane mileage as you know from here to Boston. Yeah. It's a very big place. So without the desegregation of the information we requested, it's impossible to know where these calls are being made. And once again, this is a working class neighborhood. I refuse to believe people are just home all day calling 911 and 311. Um, I'm going to go to Councilmember Rose. Thank you. You know, um, the racial disparities that um, you, we've heard of today are reminiscent of the disparities that um, we saw as a result of broken windows and stop, question, and frisk uh, policing. You know, the racial disparity you're saying is being driven by 311 calls. So I'd like to know, what is the process when a 311 call comes in? Is a car immediately dispatched to that location, which I, I highly um, find, you know, improbable because of just the response 311 gets for other types of calls, or are these calls taken and um, discussed at the meeting at, at during the squad, and a squad is given these locations to target. Um, looking for these perpetrators, um, and does doesn't this uh, reek of ra or promote racial profiling? You know that we worked so very hard under the Community Safety Act to uh, dispel and and to undo. The last, I, I'll need clarification on the last point about what you were inferring is promoting racial profiling. I didn't understand that part. So if you're getting a, a, a call to, um, it, it seems like only certain precincts where these 311 calls are coming in, and if you're not dispatching a car immediately to find these perpetrators that's out there burning, um, then how are you getting these numbers that's generated by 311? Are you then giving them to the precinct and saying, oh, the, we have these 311 calls, you need to go out and find these perpetrators. No. And in so doing, I understand. since I'm okay. sure there's not a description that comes with the 311 or a name and an address, now you're out there looking for these perpetrators that are burning. And that leads to profiling and the same situation that we had before with stop, question, and frisk, because now you're looking for someone who fits the description. I understand. Tell me what this process, okay. the 31, specifically this 311 yep. process. So I will say no to start out, and you'd have to understand, hopefully I can be quick and explain it, the process. Um, 
when you differentiate between 911 and 311, either one is coming into a precinct and, and units are being dispatched, but they're being dispatched at different rates. Obviously, 911 more priority. Of course. Quicker. 311, uh, I would like to have it that officers are being dispatched immediately to that too, but the reality is oftentimes it's not. We don't but, even get an officer dispatched lots of times right. to but more officers for, for these types of calls, the reason I said no is for these types of calls in the priority of what we deal with, officers are not going to a location after receiving a call of somebody smoking in front of my stoop and finding no one and then spending an inordinate amount of time looking for that person. Um, that, that's, in my opinion, that is not happening. It's, it's very different from a robbery or something of that nature where they would canvas for that person. Um, 311 calls come into the precinct. Officers get dispatched. Uh, depending on the call volume or what else is going on, they may be dispatched, dispatched immediately or it could be with some delay, unfortunately. The conditions, as you said correctly, may be over by the time they get there. But that's not to say that we're going to ignore that location because who's calling today is going to be calling about the exact same location tomorrow and should be, they're entitled to and deserve to have an appropriate response from the New York City Police Department. So we expect our officers to reach out to that person where we can, uh, find out what was going on, get the, the total breadth of the scenario. What's happening here? Is this an isolated incident? Is it something that happens all the time? Um, there are, there are, when you compare 311 calls to 911 calls, there is, it, it circles back to what you started with, sir, when you talked about violence and is there a link? Okay, um, but I, I'm still, I'm having a really hard time conceptualizing how 311 is driving these numbers, this percentage of numbers, because by the time you get there, unless it's an extra long burning blunt, that um, <laughs> it, it, it would, they would no longer be burning. I, I'm, so I'm, I'm really perplexed to see how you're making this, this argument that 311 is the driver of it's these displays proportionate number. It is 311 and it is 911. And whether it was a five foot long blunt, as you said, or a <laughs> traditional one, the individuals are going to be there regardless. The person's going to still be there. And uh, what we, based on the What we see time. is the, the hanging out turns to sometimes drinking and alcohol and then turns into a fight or it's accompanied by shooting dice. And this is the reality of what, unfortunately, some individuals have to deal with to try to get into their house every day. I'm going to stop I'm, you I'm, there, I'm though, really because, because you're giving a depiction that, and it, you know, I refuse to believe in the 105. We, we don't see that. I didn't even know that was a thing anymore. Yes, people still shoot dice. I know. You're you do see little, that in some parts of the 105. You're a little older than me. But, but, but we refuse to believe that with all of these summonses and arrests, that these are just groups of people hanging out. I mean, if you told me this was the 80s, maybe it's different. In 2017, we're not seeing that. Sir, you definitely. And we credit the NYPD yeah. with that. And, right? and You're doing good police work, but. Thank you. But. Unfortunately, please it does don't still give that. Take I, I don't want you to keep feeding that depiction of, like, this is what's going on in all of these neighborhoods, because it's not. You know, so. Um, Mr. Chair, um, I hope to get. Um, some of my time back. I, I have two things that I really want to um, uh, get to. Um, are, are, are offices still held to productivity goals? And how then, if they are, how then um, are these arrests um, uh, weighed? And um, is there any incentivization um, um, for, for these types of arrests? So since January of 2014, I've chaired with several different chief of departments the weekly CompStat meetings. And um, does activity come up at CompStat meetings? It does occasionally. But I'm, I'm quite proud of what we've been able to accomplish 
in transforming the police department um, from one that uh, critics would say was numbers driven to one that is results driven. And, and when you look at what is discussed at Comstat in 2014 and 15, 16 and 17, and currently in 2018, it, what is going on in the particular area? What are your resources? What is your plan to combat the, and make New York City safer? Um, arrests and summonses, at times they may come up, but there is no push for numbers, for numbers' sake. There is no push for uh, a particular number of numbers. And, and this is exactly how and why we have transformed 422,000 arrests to 286,000 arrests, and now down already 7% this year. Um, that, that is in a four-year period, and when we have now days where we don't record a shooting in New York City, and we have index crimes at levels that we've never seen before in New York City. This is why police departments all over the country are coming to New York City to see what we are doing. We are not perfect. So we're, no, we we're definitely no longer doing in the right direction. Uh, quote, um, uh, goals. I'm sorry? Officers no longer have um, uh, productivity, I'm sorry, productivity goals. There is no expectation that officers have to come in with number X of whether it's summonses, stops, or arrests. Thank you. And um, my last question is um, uh, paired with a, a comment. Um, Staten Island? <laughs> You can continue. I'm giving you six minutes because oh, Staten you. Island. Oh, because it. we're okay. Staten Island, and um, I, and I did not hear any numbers for um, for Staten Island. So I guess we we are not smoking marijuana in Staten Island. I can I can guarantee you that there are marijuana arrests made in Staten Island, but not in the top they, 15 out of 77 are, precincts. And I'm sure they're um, disproportionately in the North Shore of Staten Island? That would be the 120, the 121? As a matter of fact, I could tell you in one second. 120 precinct. Thirteen percent increase in marijuana arrests last year, 251 to 285, and then significantly less in the remaining precincts in Staten Island. Marijuana summonses, which coincides unfortunately with the violent crime. Unlawful possession of marijuana, 221.05. Uh, very few something summonses, if I'm reading this correctly. And what are those numbers for um, the 122 and the 123? Arrests. Arrests. 121, 53. Okay. I, okay. Um, Say the numbers again, I'm sorry. 122, 5. 123, 57. Okay, you don't have to go any further. Um, I think I made my point. Um, I, I just want to, because I, I have time. That was 2016. Uh, I'm sorry. I got to move okay. on, Council um, um, Councilmember. Got to go to Barron, but I'm going to let you give you. I'm, I'm just finishing. Okay. I'm not asking okay. you a question. Okay. Um, well, a yes or no question. Um, I, I think it's egregious that my colleague had to um, ask to have a resolution passed here. Um, because a, a woman was um, raped and violated in the uh, custody of NYPD. Um, and so um, I'd like to know if NYPD is supporting the resolution, Resolution 177, um, which I'm sure you know is uh, to include in the penal law um, 130.05 to include individuals in police custody as being categorically incapable of consenting to sexual conduct with a police officer? Uh, yes, council member. So I, part of department policy, that has always been longstanding department policy that this is completely unacceptable and wrong. And the legislation being proposed 
essentially brings the law into alignment with what our policy has been. And so the NYPD will be supporting this resolution. Yeah, where I mean the law is the, the law is in line with our policy. There, there's right. There's no daylight. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you Councilmember Rose. Going to Councilmember Barron, followed by Barron, uh, Councilmember Deutsch. Thank you to the chairs and thank you to thank you to the panel. Chief Shea, you are the crime control strategies person for the police department. Chief of crime control strategies. I am. Okay. For you to say that you have no reason to believe that officers differentiate in their treatment of black and Latino communities and how they treat white communities is quite telling of how people in power don't understand the systemic embedded practices of racism that still exist in this country today. So if you don't believe that there's any uh, differentiation in how officers treat black and white communities, why do we need implicit basis training? It would say to me that if you're coming from the position that they don't treat communities differently, then this implicit bias training really is superfluous and unneeded. That's just a statement for the record. In terms of the broad discretion that officers have, which results in these racial disparities for our communities, and for you to come before this body with no data supporting what you say are the 311 calls that generate this is insulting. If you're Comstat and if you have these strategies and if you're saying these are the results of calls made to our precincts, you should be able to present the stacks of the calls that generated these results. If people are only arrested for smoking marijuana or burning, as the phrase goes, if a person puts in a call, as my colleague has said, oh, I smell marijuana, or there are people uh, in, the in, the, in the lobby, and I smell marijuana, and a policeman comes in, and there is no one at that moment smoking marijuana, how does the officer then get to issue a summons to a person? Are they asking them to empty their pockets? Are they asking them to go through their pockets? Are they subjected to stop and frisk simply because they're there and someone issued a complaint without any description? Is that person subject to being frisked? That's a question. Is that person subject to being frisked? No, they're not. Okay, so then how does the person get a summons if they're in the presence of where marijuana had been smoked, but they're not smoking? How do people get these summons if they're not smoking, which would result in an arrest? Well, there's a multitude of ways that an officer, so that's a hypothetical question. I'd have to have every fact pattern is unique. Um, you know, so I, I wouldn't want to comment on a hypothetical situation, but. There are a number of ways that officers come into contact with individuals. Can you share them with us? Let's not do hypothetical. From your records, from your data, what are those situations? Sure. The officer walks into the lobby of a building or walks in through a park or, or is anywhere else within his or her area of assignment and sees an individual with marijuana in their hand getting ready to roll up a cigarette. That would be a situation where it's uh, in plain view to the officers, it's a situation which would have subject the individual to an arrest pre our policy change, and currently, because of the policy change, would currently subject that person to a summons. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you, and uh, I agree that we need to not conclude this hearing, but uh, adjourn it, uh, postpone it so that we can get the answers, so that we can have them come back and explain the data and how they say they use this data for their uh, results. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmembers Ulrich, Williams, and Reynoso. We'll now go to, to Councilmember Deutsch for questions, followed by Hem, Miller, and Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I just want to say that uh, just a few years ago, uh, I got several complaints about marijuana use in one of my parks in my district. It was a home crest playground. 
and I notified the local precinct, the 61st precinct, who in turn um, notified narcotics. And they came down, they had a, uh, an operation there where they just sat there. And they did find seven individuals who uh, um, had marijuana in the park. There was, there was smoked marijuana in the park. And in the interim, they um, followed the vehicle and stopped the vehicle, and they had in the vehicle about $50,000 worth of pills. So, which is, I think, which is great that they took um, all these narcotics off the streets, because you don't can imagine how many people can, um, could overdose from that amount of pills. Uh, so my first question is, is that, um, first of all, how many marijuana arrests are there throughout the city in 2017? So 17, there was approximately 17,500. So uh, from this, that's arrests or summonses? Those are arrests. Arrest. So from the 17,500, I'm just curious, um, how many of those arrests um, were found, let's say, uh, maybe a handgun on that individual or um, other narcotics? Do you have a number on that? I, I do not in front of me, no. Yeah, if you could get it, if you could get it for me. I, I will tell you that the handgun is uh, uh, not going to be, it's not an insignificant number, but it's not going to be the majority, certainly. Um, so we can work on getting numbers in terms of 221.10 charged as a top charge versus an ancillary charge, and hopefully that will provide some of those answers. Okay, or well, if um, the per that individual had other types of narcotics yeah. on them, on their, on their possession. I'd be curious to know that. Um, and see, what disturbs me is, is that if someone is driving um, under the influence of alcohol, so the alcohol, I think the longest uh, period of time that the alcohol stays in the system is probably 10 hours. So if you do pull someone over who's driving uh, D uh, DWI, you'd be able to check them within the first few hours to see if they're above that alcohol level um, and then make an arrest based on that or, 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 or let them go. Um, but you mentioned before the marijuana use, that, that impairs your driving ability, is that, is that correct? Yes, not just marijuana, other drugs as well. So, and now I'm talking specifically about mar marijuana. So if someone has marijuana, which I'm, I'm kind of um, um, confused about this. So if someone has marijuana into possession, either he's trying to sell it or he would use it. So if you would pull someone over who's under the influence and marijuana could stay in your system from when you initially use it for weeks, uh, days or weeks, so how would, you, how would the NYPD determine if they pull someone over who has marijuana in the system if that person, if, if it's arrestable or not? That's, that's a great question, and it's something that I am uh, struggling with currently. Um, when, when you look at the topic of drugs and specifically marijuana and operating a motor vehicle, essentially the law uh, prohibits anyone from operating a motor vehicle while their ability to operate that vehicle is impaired. Um, so you've ingested marijuana, you're driving right now, and you are impaired. The impaired part is the difficult part. How the NYPD and other agencies um, deal with this is drug recognition experts, so individuals that are trained because the tests are not, they are very different than uh, the alcohol testing tests. So drug recognition experts are trained to look at things such as the pupils of the eyes, um, the, the motion, how the individual responds to stimulus and things of that nature. But uh, somebody operating a motor vehicle uh, that has ingested marijuana and their ability impaired will be subject to arrest for DWI laws. So if someone jumps a turnstile, that's what I understand. If someone jumps a turnstile, you're not harming others. So I understand when you don't make an arrest or you don't, maybe you don't issue a summons for that, you give someone a, war a warning. But 
if we allow people to continue, I mean, I have a lot of 301 calls and people calling my office about marijuana use in my district, so I welcome narcotics to come in. And I have to be very honest, but, um, but if someone, if we allow people to smoke marijuana, how does the NYPD, how do we look at that, that person who's now smoking their marijuana and God forbid, God forbid kills someone on the streets, could be a family member, a friend, a neighbor, anyone. How do we control that? That's, that's what you're describing is very difficult to control. Uh, what's less difficult to control is when you have a controlled environment and you are pulling somebody over for operating a motor vehicle, whether they run a stop sign, a red light, or swerving, or driving too fast. And then based on the scenario in front of you that you encounter, you have evidence that leads you to believe that they've recently smoked marijuana. Uh, that, that is the area that um, you know, needs to be looked at, in my opinion, a little closer to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep the people in New York City safe. Um, and, and it is something that I have been for some time now looking at and, and uh, plan to continue um, because I think there's probably some areas of improvement that we can make on our side. So I think that's a, a, long, a longer conversation, yep. uh, just on that issue alone, because we're talking about everything else when it comes to marijuana. And, and there's a side to it, this to educate, too, the, the public, um, because we, we clearly do not want people operating a motor vehicle um, with anything less than their 100% attention to the road. But you would not necessarily know that the person just finished uh, smoking that joint. Well, you'll smell certainly, and, and you will have people making statements. Uh, I've had it happen to me numerous times. Uh, only through statements? A combination. Uh, you'll have a combination, and this is where perhaps, uh, you know, additional training is necessary for our officers, but how do, you, how do you spot somebody operating a vehicle under the influence? And again, you want to pull it to marijuana. I'm, I'm thinking of other drugs. We have significant opiate problems right now in New York City. So in, in South Brooklyn, for, for example, in Staten Island, we do not want anyone operating a motor vehicle in New York City with anything other than a sound mind and all their faculties paying attention to the road. So whether it's cocaine, heroin, methamphetamines, or marijuana, you should not be operating a vehicle, a motor vehicle. And we plan on doing a uh, public awareness on this topic. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Going to go to Councilmember Miller, followed by Miller will be Williams and then Reynosa. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for holding a very, very important, relevant uh, hearing on this topic here. So we've been having discussion with the administration, and administration over the past four years about the disparities in marijuana arrests and summonses. Um, the mayor himself uh, was clearly articulate in what his policy was. And, and that policy was consistent with what we see, not just nationwide uh, and, uh, and, and, and other local municipalities around the decriminalization of marijuana and, and the reduction in those arrests. But yet we see disproportionately um, arrests and summonses being issued. I happen to, as my colleagues here in, in Southeast Queens, uh, represent 105 precinct as well. 1,651, absolutely ridiculous. And so whoever is responsible for evaluating and assessing, aggregating this data, we should have a real conversation here about what it is. Um, last year, uh, 2016, uh, when the 1,651 summonses was brought to my attention, um, I spoke to local precinct commander. In fact, the matter is we spoke to Chief O'Neill when he was in Rosedale, and um, we were supposed to have a further conversation about it. Um, at that moment, the local commander was charged with uh, discussing those numbers with the council member and myself. To this day, we have not had that conversation. Contrarily, as, as has been mentioned before, that there's obviously a direct correlation between those summonses and broken windows. Fact of the matter is, is that when we mentioned that correlation between the two, they said, absolutely, we believe in broken windows. That's the reason why we 
make these marijuana arrests. And, 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 and so, to, and if you look at the corresponding numbers of less than 2%, less than 1% of those summonses become an uh, arrest, the arrests make up less than 1% of the summonses, is it justified? And, and you know, how, how, how do we justify that? And what would be your response to someone uh, or a policy that is clearly not the policy that you articulated, uh, policy that the administration has said time and time again that they was not in favor of, how do we justify that happening? And what would be your response? Okay, I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part again? What would be your response to a broken windows policy being implemented around the marijuana arrest? So, so um, I, I would listen, my response would be I would listen to all of the complaints, because I think that's our job, to hear complaints such as this, and to honestly evaluate how we police New York City. And Wait, so, so, so are you saying now that the policy around policing in New York City is broken windows? I think that we have to be responsive to community complaints. So you're talking to three elected. Do you have a piece of 105 as well? No. Barry was just in here. And, and, and here, and, and, and the community is, 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 is quite diverse in, in demographics. Um, and I'm sure um, that the Glen Oaks, Belrose uh, area don't have the number of marijuana summonses that Cambria Heights and Rosedale and, and other areas there. But, and, and, and while we had this conversation, and never got an opportunity to aggregate the data, the very next year, we are increased by another 200 arrests. This is, there are precincts in the city that don't have 100. How do you have 2,000? The crime does, the, the, and, 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 and the 105 has some of the lowest crime in the city outside of marijuana arrests. How do you justify this? So when you, when you speak to, and the 105 is a beautiful command, and it is a big command spanning north to south on, on the Nassau border. But when we speak to uh, the crime rates and the place New York City is in right now, we often quote the seven major index crimes and, and, and the shooting and the homicide numbers, and there is a lot of positive news. But, but there are other categories of crime. And, and thankfully, most of them are down, but there is the balance of certain types of crimes in particular areas, certain types of complaints coming in that have to be addressed by the police. What we are the correlations between those certain type of crimes? What, what are they, robberies, are they burglaries? What are they, and what, are they, what is the correlation between that and marijuana arrests? I, I would pose the question, and I would say it several times today, what would you have the police do when people are calling? We would be criticized rightfully so, so, so if here's, we here's were what I'm ignoring to you. community complaints. What I'm saying complaints. to you, when that we're in community board meetings, that when we're in civic meetings, that we're in precinct council, meet, council meetings, the community is opposed to over-policing of young black and brown men of color. They are vehemently, adamantly opposed to that. And so no one is calling. There is not this this abundance of 311 calls that would justify that, and if there is, produce the numbers. I, I agree with your statement that the community is opposed to over-policing of people of color. I agree with that 100%. I also submit that at the same time, and not in conflict, that, that many of the same people will say, I don't want certain conditions on my block where my kids are walking by or the playground or it doesn't walking exist. into the store. It does not exist, and the council member said it. There are the you, complaints. Listen, I, would, I would submit that you should take a ride out. You should take a ride with your commander, your, your precinct commander, your, any of your subordinates. I would, I, I would suggest that everybody on the day is there uh, take a tour through the district and, and see that certainly there is absolutely no justification. And then... If there is, then there is 
in, in, in abdication of responsibility on the part of the NYPD if, in fact, this has been going on for the last decade in that particular precinct. Every year, don't you want to know why this precinct has these numbers every year? And how do we fix it? How, how is that possible? How, how is it that every year this problem exists and no one has looked at this number? There is someone at that, on that day that is charged and responsible with looking at these numbers and saying, hey, we have a problem. How do we address this problem? Ten years later? I, I believe it's nearly ten years. I know for a fact it's six years running now that the 105 is, is light years ahead of any other precinct in that. Just the fact that when you look at these numbers, 1,851, and then it's increased by 200, and the next, what's the second highest in the precinct, 400, in, the, in the city? 400? They make up less than, than they're making up nearly 15% of all marijuana summonses in the entire city. Somebody's being promoted on the backs of black and brown. I can't believe that, that we're having a conversation here that, doesn't include, that, that, that just doesn't say that these numbers, this is an atrocity and we have to figure this out. But to sit there and try to justify it, thank you. Thank you. All righty, going to go to Councilmember Williams, followed by Williams will be Reynoso. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, thank you to the panel. Um, I actually wasn't planning to ask any questions, but I was disturbed by a few things. Uh, the first one, Councilmember Barron, I, I wasn't here, so I didn't want to repeat too many questions, but she, she alluded that somebody mentioned that they didn't think there was different treatment in the black and brown community and in the white community. So I just want to, I wanted to confirm that that was the belief of the police department. No, but if you could, I apologize, can you repeat that, sir? And then <coughs> Councilmember Barron yep. said that someone alluded uh, to no, the fact. No, uh, Chief Shea, not someone, Chief Shea, the okay. panelists. <laughs> Oh, uh, Chief Shea, that you uh, believe that there was not a different, uh, there was no different policing in the black community and brown community and is in the white community. Can you just confirm, is that the belief of there, the police? There department? was a question earlier, and I don't remember, I have to see the exact question and the exact phrasing. Um, and it was alluding to what we're speaking of today, mm -hmm. uh, disparate racial data in who was being arrested. And that was the backdrop of the question, and I forget what exact precinct we were referring to. And I would have to see the question, but the question was essentially, to my recollection, is that a result of people being treated differently? Mm -hmm. uh, are people treated differently? Um, a white officer, well, a white officer wasn't said. Uh, a black individual versus a Hispanic individual versus a white individual, and is a New York City police officer coming upon that scene and treating I them see. differently. So let, let me just I, I that can't, I said was no. All right, I can't speak for individual officers, so I I, I really Correct. can't. Correct. Uh, but what I can say is that people are policed differently based on where they live and based on what they look like. Period. Whether it's an individual officer or a systemic issue, and so if. If, you don't, if that's not a belief, I'm very concerned because I think we've been working to try to better that, and I think we've had some success. But if that's not even a belief, I'm, I'm just extremely concerned. So I just want to... What, what I was saying <clears throat> earlier, and I will say again, is that I believe New York City police officers enforce the law impartially. Okay, that's not true. Okay. Um, I, I just want to make sure we're, we're clear about that. I don't want to make sure I put that on the record. And if you believe that... That is, that is also a problem. I, I think there are a lot of... And that's under the context of where we have come from, whether it's broken windows 20 years ago, New York City of old, to New York City today. We've made dramatic improvements. Great. So, so hold on, because I read... I read it. to look for improvements. And the improvements are here listed. I actually, actually tried to cite them. I also cite that uh, police officers discharging their weapons are down. I also cite, uh, for the last time at least I checked, complaints against officers are down, and those are things that we have to celebrate as we're celebrating uh, crime being down. But I do that uh, not giving credence that it should have been worse in the first place. Like it should never have been what it was before. And so when we acknowledge that while we have to celebrate it, it shouldn't be what it is now, so we have to make it better. So if we're going to rest on laurels, of getting better from a place we absolutely should not have been in the first place, we also have a problem. 
But I, I always try to take time to celebrate because we are going in, in, in a good way. But I have to acknowledge where we are. These numbers are a huge problem still, and we have to keep pushing it down. And what concerns me, if you believe there's no disparate impact and people aren't being policed differently, I'm not even sure what we're discussing. Because even in the face of the numbers, I mean, we got to where we are now with people telling us we were crazy before. When I, we were doing everything we were five, six, seven years ago, we were trying to make the city all um, crazy. The sky was going to crack open and black and brown people were going to come and destroy the city. That didn't happen. And so we're telling you again, based on these numbers, that we also have a problem. And I think when it comes to what are the police going to do when they're called, I think one of the problems that I have with broken windows, and sometimes to the chagrin of my um, advocates that I work with, is not the, the theory itself, it is how it's being applied. And so the fact that the police are the ones that are um, trying to fix the broken window all the time is the problem. If you only have summons and arrests, it's a problem. So my thing is perhaps the police aren't the ones that need to be responding every single time um, there is someone smoking marijuana, if at all. If there's other things that are happening alongside it, then we have to discuss. But everything that we do, we're asking the police officer to go and write a summons or write an arrest, and that's, not, that's a problem for me. On the flip side, I'd like to know what happens when someone calls about an opioid crisis in Staten Island. Are they arrested or summonsed? If somebody, you'd, you'd have to give me a little more details in the question, but if somebody calls up and says, what exactly? There's someone who is high on opioids, or they think is high on opioids, or you go and discover that they're high on opioids or something like that. What happens to that person? This, uh, if somebody's high on opioids, if somebody's high on marijuana, somebody's not getting arrested for being high mm -hmm. uh, for either of the offenses. Okay. So if, you're, if you have marijuana on you, Oh, and you're high, what's happening? If, if an officer encounters somebody that is in possession of marijuana, generally speaking, they would receive a summons for that. Okay. So, my, and I know my time's running out, so I'm going to finish. But I just want to say, you look at drugs and how it's dealt with in each of these communities, you cannot tell me that there's not disparate impact. When you look at how the opioid crisis is being dealt with, there are still black and brown people in prison right now uh, from many, many years ago when this issue was in the black and brown community. When we look at marijuana as people are trying to now make it legal to sell and preventing the very people who were selling it before from being able to sell it, not looking at the people who are in prison right now for the same thing we're trying to legalize, that is a problem. <laughs> When we look at the numbers here, I believe white people smoke marijuana as well. I also believe when you look at the data, uh, you will see that they smoke it at the same amount of uh, time. If you are saying that it is a response to three on one calls, I want to see those numbers. I hope you show it uh, to the chair people as well. I can't believe that they'll, they'll match up uh, directly. And I also don't believe that if, if they don't want to call in the other communities, that it will always lead to an arrest and a summons. That is a problem in reality that we have to deal with. Uh, and until we deal with that, we're going to have a problem. Even as we're celebrating where we are now, uh, that's, just, that's a huge concern. And I'm going to end with this. Um, and, and from the annals of, uh, I couldn't believe it wasn't even illegal to begin with. I'm glad to hear you're supporting Rezo 177. Uh, hopefully, um, whatever needs to happen will happen. Uh, lastly, I'm confused because I've heard um, the police commissioner allude that they will no longer do broken windows. So I just need to know, before I even assess bad or good, uh, are we still uh, policing under the broken windows theory? Sir, answering that question, 100 people will have 100 different definitions of what in their mind is broken windows sure. policing. That's, so that's right off the bat, let me say that. Um, we expect our officers. So let me say this. Are you policing in any type of theory of broken windows? Any definition that you Again, I, I would default to the same statement I just I made. I, I think that means different things, and the, the definition over the years has transformed. I'll take that to mean probably. <laughs> um, no, but that may I, not be accurate. I got it. I just have a concern of what that means. And I want to understand what it means, because I have a different view than even some of my colleagues. So I need to understand what that means so I can um, respond in kind. But, but thank you very much. I thank you. And I, and I just want to add to that. You know, we hear from a lot of cops. They would really be out, rather be out doing Work, work on other real things, addressing that's violent crime, so that's exactly rather what we're than doing. wasting their time writing summonses for marijuana. By the way, could you become a police officer if you smoked marijuana in the past? 
Can you become a police officer? Absolutely, you can. Okay. So do you realize how many, by these disparities existing, how many police officers were, people were preventing in these communities of color from becoming police officers and mayors and you, you can past become presidents a police and officer. even council members. Now, I did not inhale. <laughs> but the point we're making is we're killing our young people's dreams. Yeah. And um, I think council member, you, you know, we're out here over enforcing it. But, you know, I refuse to believe with a force of what, 36,000 people that none of them have ever enjoyed would smoke marijuana. Council member, I think you misunderstood the chief. He said that you can become a police officer. You still can. You can. Okay. Just to, to clarify, um, is it disqualifying if you've been arrested or convicted of, of <laughs> exactly. a marijuana offense, a, pos a possession in the fifth degree? Mm -hmm. It will be weighed, but it would not be an automatic, to my knowledge, disqualification. So for we're an interested a misdemeanor. in those numbers, too. All righty. We're going to go to Councilmember Reynoso. Yeah. Uh, in 10 years, this hearing, we're going we're gonna to look back at this hearing, and we're going to be shocked uh, at the conversations that we're having regarding the enforcement of marijuana. Um, the same way we had the conversation regarding stop and frisk, um, this is this is going to go along the same the same conversations. Um, the sky is not falling um, uh, when it comes to the use of marijuana in the city of New York, especially the over policing of black and brown communities. And you guys just happen to be at this table at that time. Um, we'll have a conversation in 10 years, and hopefully, we'll look back at all the justice that we bring moving forward. I do believe in the legalization of marijuana. I do think that we have to talk about mandating that more than. 50% of the licenses that go out for the sale of marijuana be exclusively for MWBEs um, so that we don't uh, uh, begin to, to turn it into a white enterprise and legalize it and, and all the benefits go to people um, that are not over police and not are suffering the consequences of, of, being, of being arrested or summoned for marijuana. I want to talk about the 90th precinct. The 90th precinct in Brooklyn is a, is a special precinct because we were, I believe, number three in the number of stop and frisks that happened in 2012. Number three. Even though we were one of the highest gentrified communities in the city of New York. So, so, so I want to put it in perspective because I think we were the most policed uh, precinct in the entire city when you put it in perspective that less than, in the 90th precinct, less than 50% of those people are black and brown and all the 50% were white. Um, and if we're number three on that list, and the majority of the people being stopped were people of color, then you can see that per capita, we were probably being stopped, or black and brown people in the 90th precinct were being stopped at a higher rate than anywhere else in the city of New York. That's an argument that I, I think we can make. That's like a free economics argument, but we can make that argument. I wanna talk about the 90th precinct though right now. What, how many arrests have happened in the 90th precinct related to marijuana? The data in front of me for the 90th precinct is 185 arrests in 2017. And how many of those were people of color? I don't have for the 90th broken down uh, individually. It's going to be very important because now, that was 2012, now we're in 2017, five years later, uh, there are even less people of color in the 90th precinct. Um, and I want to see how many people in a gentrified community are being arrested and how many of those people are black and brown people and how many people are white people. I just want to see that correlation. I want to see um, those 311 calls that are being made uh, and where they're coming from as well. I think that's very important. I'm also um, uh, of the notion that uh, in the 90th precinct, um, the over-policing does happen in specific parts of the community that tend to be uh, portions that are mostly people of color and not in the white portions of the district. I think the 90th precinct is a great test case as to how exactly um, officers are treating people from the same precinct, in the same community, with very distinct uh, divisions uh, related to race. So I really want to see those statistics when you get the chance. Um, it, would be, it would be very helpful. Just the breakdown of people of color in the 90th precinct that have been arrested or summoned for marijuana. 
Um, that's going to be that's going to be very helpful to me. So I would love to see that. Um, uh, and that's 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 all the information I want. And again, if we legalize marijuana in the state, I would have I would just want to note on the record that the majority of licenses should go to MWBEs exclusively to MWBEs. I would I would caution to say the first 100 licenses should go to MWBEs and then we open it up to the to the general market. But again, in 10 years, we're going to be laughing about this conversation that we're having about a about a drug that's going to be legalized um, and will no longer be criminalized. But thank you, Chair, for for this hearing. Uh, both chairs for this hearing. Thank you, Councilman Reynoso, and I actually have uh, your numbers here, and I'll ask Jordan to give that to you from the Drug Policy Alliance. I want to thank them for uh, a lot of the data that we have today. Uh, I also want to thank you uh, for coming in today. I mean, as you can see, um, we're very interested in this conversation, uh, you know, broken windows, policing, whatever you want to call it, um, when you're looking at the disparities that exist still uh, in this city and how many uh, kids' lives we are ruining, uh, in particular in, our, in communities of color around marijuana. Uh, we have a lot of work to do around this. And very reminiscent of, you know, we had this conversation around stop and frisk, just as Councilmember Williams alluded to, on where individuals thought, you know, the world was going to go crazy uh, if, we, if we decreased the amount of stop and frisk. This is no, this is no different. Go to any college campus, go across colors, uh, across socioeconomic status, you will see individuals smoking marijuana. So we really want to see this issue seriously dealt with. I will certainly be at Comstat, and I'm very interested in hearing uh, a lot more from uh, the commissioner uh, and the mayor on how they are going to ensure that this disparity does not continue to exist uh, over the next four years and that we see real progress, tangible progress. Uh, on these numbers and where there is a disconnect, as Councilmember Miller, uh, my neighbor, alluded to, there needs to be conversations with inspectors and others who are really using heavy-handed enforcement uh, in these areas. And quite frankly, when you look at the 105, because we could stay there for a second, it's a very big precinct. Yeah. That's why we had to build another one. Yeah. So that means when officers come into the community, they are gung ho on writing these easy summonses uh, and, 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 and arresting people for marijuana because it's just the easy thing to do. And this is obviously why we're building the, the other precinct. So I believe officers, once again, have better things to do with their lives and they want to do better things at the job than to be writing these summonses and filling out a bunch of paperwork for them. Let's get them out on the streets to fight real crime uh, and not necessarily these marijuana arrests if they're not connected to any violent or serious crime. And, um, and that's, that's my uh, closing statement. I really have nothing left to say because the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, we do want to see that data because that data, I don't even have to see the data to know the answer to the question. Um, and I would hope that you didn't come here unprepared with that intention, um, but uh, the data will, will speak for itself. So we look forward to seeing that, and this is why we're gonna pass this piece of legislation as well. Uh, we'll go to Council Member Lanceman now. Sure, you know, I, I, maybe I should have said this at the outset, um, I felt it was, was obvious. It's really impossible to have this conversation and to think about this issue out of the context of stop and frisk, of hundreds of thousands of black and Latino young men being stopped um, for no apparent reason in the end. And as a result of that policy, there were an extraordinary number of people who were arrested and charged um, with a misdemeanor because when they were stopped and frisked, a marijuana cigarette was taken out of their pocket and oh, now it's in public and you're going to be um, uh, uh, charged with that offense. That, that's really the origin of the shift in the mayor's policy in 2014. It was the, the abuse of the marijuana possession laws in connection with stop and frisk, which itself is connected to just the almost insatiable appetite of, of the, the police department to um, touch, so to speak, black and brown young men as a way of purportedly keeping us safe. In that vein, 
the um, distinction between arrest and, and summonsing, certainly it's better to issue a summons than it is to um, affect an arrest, but the fact that there are still so many people who are getting that summons, who are being forced to go to summons court on pain of, of a warrant being issued for their arrest if they miss a, a, a hearing date, um, is, is very serious as, as well. And I, I feel maybe we didn't make, we, made too we make too much of that distinction between the arrest and, and the summons. It still is concerning mm -hmm. that so many people are getting summonses mm -hmm. for possession of, of uh, marijuana. With that, um, Chief, you've been reading statistics precinct by precinct during your testimony. Um, is there any, that's something that we had asked for. Is there any reason that we couldn't get that from you um, later this afternoon? The precinct by precinct breakdown you have, arrest for summonses, sure. et cetera? <coughs> Council member, that's, uh, and I, I just want to make clear, I, I think the chief did a pretty good job of making it clear in terms of the statistics that we're using. In order to get the 311911. No, no, I understand. Right now, at the moment, I'm going to ask about that. Right. At the moment, I'm just asking about the arrest and summons data, which the chief has had in front of him and which he's been citing throughout his testimony. Can we get that this afternoon? You seem to have it. And then we can talk about the 311911 stuff. Sure. Let us, we're going to come back and try to get you something this afternoon. Okay. And now on the 311911 issue, when do you think you can get us? the information that we have asked for. So again, it's the challenge was, and I just want to put it back on the record in case it, it seemed to have gotten lost in the conversation. The challenge with 311911 data is that the complaints that come in, whether they be to 311 or 911, uh, they're based on the narrative that the complainant provides. So the narrative complainant provides can use the word marijuana or somebody may say somebody, as the chief said, is smoking outside. It could be a real cigarette, it could be a marijuana cigarette, and it may not use the word marijuana in the narrative, or somebody could complain that if somebody's using drugs outside, right? So what we, we did the best we could in preparing for the hearing uh, to have some sort of data here, uh, and we did a search of the term marijuana and weed and a few different variations of spelling of marijuana, uh, that points to an increase in complaints, both 311 and 911. No, I, I no, no I just, but I just I need, understand that that's I, I your... I need to say this on the record because I think a lot of it got lost in, in a lot of the conversation. So there's an increase across the board when it comes to the complaints, whether 311 or 911. Um, the... The issue is, in, in terms of, we don't know how many uh, marijuana complaints there are under the drug category. Now, we didn't want to come here and tell you, oh, we have thousands and thousands of drug complaints because we would be capturing cocaine, possibly heroin, or any other drug, right? So we tried to stay as accurate as possible with the data we were providing. We didn't do the smoke search. We didn't do the drug search. So with that said, I think the number of marijuana complaints would certainly increase. I mean, there's already an increase across the board through the search term marijuana. I'm sure there are more marijuana complaints in the, dr in the drug category and in the smoke category, but we are unable to tell how many of those there are. I, with that said, I'm going to do my best to your question. I'm going to do my best to try to get you as much data as possible on the complaints. Um, there are going to be caveats. I'm just letting you know now. Uh, there are going to be caveats because there will be marijuana complaints hidden in the drug category and in the smoke category and whatever other category that may emerge. So with that caveat, we're going to do our best to give you the numbers. Look, you have said, and I, I don't mean to beat a dead horse. I thought we did this in the beginning. We we're all kind of mm -hmm. on the same page here. You are relying on 311 and 911 calls as a basis for why you are uh, ultimately making arrests or issuing summonses um, in the different precincts throughout the city. However, you're categorizing those calls in order to make that judgment 
we want, we want that data. You've got that data. I assume, as I said before, you're not making that judgment from thin air. So however you have collected that data, however you have categorized it, whether you have segregated it based on marijuana, drugs, smoking, we want that information. Under we, want, we, want, we want to know um, by precinct the 311 and 911 calls that you've gotten that could possibly indicate marijuana being smoked. So if the 311 call said drugs, the 311 call said marijuana, the 311 call said smoking, we want all of that. And the reason that we want it is because you've repeatedly said that you've relied on that information. So I'm not in a position to dispute your characterization of that data as leading to the conclusion that there's more, there are more calls or fewer calls. I, I don't have the data. I, I must have that data. We must have that data. And it's not because it's valuable in the abstract, although it is. It's because you're relying on it. So when can you get it to us? That one's going to be a little more challenging, but we commit to working on it and getting you a data set that includes all of the above categories. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. All right, we're going to call our first panel, and we're supposed to be out of here by one. Um, so I'm going to call the first panel, Chris Alexander, the Drug Policy Alliance. Cassandra Frederique, Drug Policy Alliance, Corey Peggs, Leap, Joanne Norton, Leap. Okay, I'm going to ask you to begin. Uh, you state your name for the record, who you're representing, and uh, and we're going to put three minutes on the clock uh, for each person. All righty, you may begin. Good morning, council members. My name is Joanne Norton, and I spent more than 20 years with the NYPD, where I worked, in uniform on patrol, undercover in the narcotics unit, and I retired as a lieutenant. I want to thank you for this opportunity to express my personal views on marijuana enforcement, as well as the views of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, LEAP. We are a nonprofit group of police, judges, prosecutors, and other criminal justice professionals who use our expertise to advance public safety solutions. Although I retired some time ago, decades ago, the NYPD's approach to dealing with marijuana has remained relatively unchanged. I'm appalled that we continue to waste taxpayer dollars enforcing laws that damage the relationships between officers and the communities they serve. Public marijuana use may be a nuisance to some of our neighbors, but getting the police involved in this dispute was never a good idea. As someone who has also worked as a criminal defense attorney, I can assure you that those who are arrested for small amounts of marijuana don't believe for one minute that the criminal justice system has their best interests at mind. They're not going to trust the officers who patrol their neighborhood, which means they're not going to help the police when they have information about criminal activity. Everyone's safety depends on strong communications and trust 
between police and civilians because that's how crimes are solved. Aggressively enforcing low-level marijuana laws in a state where, ironically, it's technically decriminalized is actually making it harder for police to do their jobs. We rely on the police to protect us by preventing people from committing serious crimes and arresting them when they do. We must come to terms with this reality and make building relationships and removing barriers to trust a priority over accumulating ever greater drug arrest numbers. Decades ago, the NYPD disbanded the unit devoted to enforcing gambling laws because of all the corruption that was uncovered. They didn't wait for Albany to change the laws. They simply stopped proactively enforcing them. When complaints were received, they responded, but lawful gam unlawful gambling was no longer a high priority with the department. When we know that addictive, destructive yes. drug use is clearly a medical problem, a health problem. We have to wonder what makes drug law enforcement so imperative to the NYPD today. The NYPD proactively enforces drug laws when there's no evidence this practice benefits the public or the people using the drugs. We know the public is not enthusiastic about marijuana arrests. So I can't help but wonder what drives the pursuit of numbers when it comes to drug law violations, especially when we don't see that kind of concern for rapes and burglaries and robberies, cyber crimes and other serious crimes. The pending legislation which would require reports from the NYPD about their enforcement of the laws prohibiting marijuana will go a long way towards shining a light on the department's activity in this area. But the larger issue of prohibiting the use of marijuana by adults needs to be examined. Let's take a look at the nine states in DC where marijuana is legal, regulated, and taxed to see what their experience has been. Prohibition is an idea whose time ought to be over. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. You may begin, sir. Good morning. Sorry, and we've also been joined by uh, the former chair, uh, uh, council member Vanessa Gibson. Good morning, Mr. Chair, the rest of the uh, dais. My name is Corey Pegues, and I retired as ca commanding officer of the 67th Precinct in Brooklyn. I left law enforcement in March 2013 after 21 years in uniform. Thank you for this opportunity to represent my own views as well as the views of my organization, the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, LEAP, as they pertain to marijuana enforcement. LEAP is a nonprofit group of police judges, prosecutors, and other criminal justice professionals who use our expertise to advance public safety solutions. Promoting sensible drug policy is a core component of our mission. New York exercised admirable common sense when we decriminalized personal possession of marijuana over 40 years ago. But our failure to effectively carry out that policy has been a wasteful and destructive use of police resources and tax dollars. Nearly all of the low-level marijuana arrests made in the last four decades happened between 97 and 2016, and it resulted in over 710,000 arrests, primarily of black and Latino residents. The various p positions I held throughout 21 years in the NYPD gave me a well-rounded perspective on how we address crime in our city. As we see in many big cities, gangs and members of organized crime engage in senseless acts of violence and domestic violence and rape are all too common. Overall, crime rates have been declining for some time, but any amount of violence is too much. Police ex exist to fill a critical role in our communities, keeping people safe and helping to bring perpetrators to justice. The opportunity to serve as a public is the reason I enrolled in a police academy over 25 years ago, and I stand by that decision. I did not, however, join law enforcement as perpetrate a system of unfairly enforced laws that waste time and create no public safety benefit. I did not put on my uniform every morning so I could spend hours of my time in my community's hard-earned tax dollars bringing people into the system 
for holding a small amount of marijuana. I joined the historic NYPD to keep my neighborhood safe. We can save the NYPD thousands of man hours each year and free up resources for the most serious crimes. Crime survivors deserve our utmost attention and marijuana possession is nowhere near serious enough to be wasting our limited energy while serious crimes go unsolved. In addition to the financial and public safety costs of our city's marijuana enforcement, we must address the racial disparities which have imposed further economic consequences onto hundreds of thousands of the city residents. Despite different racial demographics using marijuana at the same rates as you alluded to earlier, black New Yorkers are seven times likely to be arrested for marijuana than white New Yorkers. Even a single marijuana arrest can have serious economic and social consequences for generations of families living in these neighborhoods. Costly court fees, fines, jail time, bail costs, possible loss of an employment, and possible loss of housing make already struggling families that much more likely to fall into a cycle of poverty and crime, especially when there are children to feed elderly family members to take care. There's no excuse for continuing our destructive marijuana enforcement strategy. The NYPD has bigger things to worry about, and the good residents of our city deserve release from the unreasonable consequences of these arrests. And just to add for the record, in 21 years as commanding officer, two of the most violent precincts in the city of New York, I can say on the record, not one crime out of thousands and thousands of arrests where I saw marijuana as an aggregating factor for the, for the crime. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you for your service to the city. My name is Cassandra Frederick. I'm the New York State Director at Drug Policy Alliance. Our testimony is pretty long, but I will abridge it, and then you will have the, the real copy. We will send it to you. So as a candidate for mayor in 2013, Bill de Blasio said low-level marijuana arrests have disastrous collateral con consequences for individuals and their families. These arrests limit one's ability to qualify for student financial aid and undermine one's ability to find stable housing and good jobs. What's more, recent studies demonstrate clear racial bias in arrests for low-level possession. This policy is unjust and wrong. However, low-level marijuana possession continues to be among the most common arrests made across the city, despite the mayor, police commissioner, and other members of the city administration touting reduced arrests in recent years. These arrests also continue to be marked by extremely high racial disparities under Mayor de Blasio, as was the case under Bloomberg and Giuliani administrations. Black and Latino New Yorkers continue to comprise 85% of the more than 60,000 people arrested for low-level marijuana possession on Mayor de Blasio's watch. Most people arrested are young black and Latino New Yorkers, even though studies consistently show young white people use marijuana at higher rates. Last summer, following the release of a report by the Marijuana Arrest Research Project and Drug Policy Alliance, highlighting ongoing arrests and the continued racial disparities, the mayor launched a media attack, calling the report's findings fake news, and claimed that marijuana arrests were no longer happening in New York City. But the numbers don't lie. In 2016, there were 18,122 low-level marijuana arrests in New York City. And in 2017, there were 17,880. New York State decriminalized marijuana 40 years ago, and that law is still on the books. However, ongoing arrests for marijuana have been largely justified by a loophole left in the law that allows police officers to distinguish between public and private personal possession. Because possession in public view remains a crime, this loophole, coupled with pervasive and racial bias over policing of certain communities and stop and frisk tactics, has resulted in continued mass arrests for personal possession of marijuana despite decriminalization. The failure of decriminalization is most evident in New York City. In 2014, then Mayor then Police Commissioner Bratton issued a statement in coordination with Mayor de Blasio that instructed NYPD officers to no longer make an arrest when they have discovered marijuana on a person in the course of a search. The accompanying police instruction, Order 43, represented a clarification of the existing law to law enforcement. This policy change represented a visible shift from the NYPD's previous practices and signaled the potential for the increased efficacy of New York's 1977 decriminalization statute. However, the result has been much more of the same. 
In 2015, although arrests have been reduced from their 2014 level, the racial disparities in who is being arrested has remained consistent, and more than eight in 10 of those arrested being black or Latino. I just wanna say, because I hear the, bu the bell ring, um, Order 43 was the law that was already on the books. So NYPD has made a real big uh, shift and policy announcement and Mayor de Blasio continued to show that we are moving away from this and all this stuff, but we already decided this in 40 years ago. 2017 was the 40th anniversary of New York passing a marijuana decriminalization law, which basically said we don't wanna use law enforcement resources to focus on marijuana enforcement. That law is 40 years old. And so the fact that this administration continues to tout something that we've already decided 40 years ago is inauthentic, disingenuous, and continues to gaslight New Yorkers, specifically those of color. A portion of reduction in arrest for marijuana possession can be attributed to a shift in police officers issuing summonses, which is exactly what we said should not happen. What we fought for in 2014 was for NYPD to reduce marijuana enforcement. We specifically warned that them moving and shifting to summonses would still have detrimental collateral consequences on New Yorkers, specifically New Yorkers that have different levels of citizenship in the United States. We were very, very clear in 2014 that moving from arrest to summons was not an adequate or an effective solution to marijuana enforcement. And as you continue to see, as they move from arrest to um, summonses, what has what has transpired is actually less transparency. Because again, in 2014, when advocates worked in good faith with NYPD and the Mayor de Blasio administration, we said, if you are going to move to summonses, they can't be as high as the arrests were, and we need the, the data. We need the racial disparities, we need the age, we need to know where these are happening in ge geographically. We met with Mark J for multiple times and we asked for them to change the summons form, we asked for the data to be publicly available, we asked for the racial breakdown, and they have continuously said that that is not possible, that they've changed the summons form, we still don't get the data, and so they've literally just moved it so that we can see less. They did not wake up one day and decide that they were gonna end marijuana arrests. Communities United for Police Reform, Drug Policy Alliance, Vocal New York, Make the Road, Legal Aid Society, Brooklyn Defenders, Bronx Defenders. We pushed for this, and we said we can't take your short-sighted reforms as what we need to be moved possible. And here we are, four years later, under a different administration that has made it very clear that marijuana enforcement is gonna be used to continue to break up families. We said this four years ago, and they did not move. And so in closing, we recognize that New York does not operate in a vacuum. But Mayor de Blasio and the council members have publicly vowed to fight the Trump administration to protect New Yorkers' rights when it comes to immigration, women's rights, and civil liberties. But the, but the above cases show that without really ending marijuana prohibition, which leads to law enforcement abuses, these words ring hollow. There is no excuse for the New York City arrest to continue in 2017. Mayor de Blasio pledged to end biased policing practices. If the end looks like more, of, more than 61,000 arrests on his watch and the same level of severe racial disparities, then the mayor has failed to carry out his campaign promises to black and Latino New Yorkers. Further, we strongly recommend that police and district attorneys in the five boroughs of New York immediately cease arresting, charging, and prosecuting anyone for violation of the New York State Criminal Law Section 221.10. District attorneys should take the additional step of sealing all prior arrest records for low-level marijuana possession as their colleagues in Philadelphia, San Francisco, San Diego, and other jurisdictions have done. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Chris Alexander, Drug Policy Alliance. Uh, so I won't echo, I, I echo everything that's been uh, said today, and I'll be super brief so we can move on to questions, but uh, just to focus the council and the committees on Order 43 um, and what it also allowed the NYPD to continue to do, uh, which is the use of constructive burning as uh, a cause for continued uh, interaction with people. 
Um, what also was listed in order, in order 43 in terms of instructing law enforcement to not make the arrest during the course of that search if marijuana was discovered was the fact that they could continue to use the smell, the odor, uh, the, uh, the odor of marijuana as a justification for them making any type of search or uh, interacting with people. Um, this was really what was focused on by the NYPD today in their testimony as the cause for a lot of these arrests resulting that they believe that 18,000 people were smoking publicly in the streets of New York, um, that all of these individuals happen to be black or Latino, or at least 86 percent of them. Um, we just encourage the council in that further inquiry of the NYPD to focus on the fact um, that in many cases marijuana is not found. They may, call, they may point to public burning as being the cause for the interaction, but marijuana is not being located on the persons uh, that they're stopping, that they're arresting. Um, they're oftentimes using the scent um, as, as, a, as a cause to interact. So I just want us to focus on that as we move forward to further um, questioning of the NYPD. I also wanted to push back on some fallacies that were said by the NYPD today um, about increased traffic, traffic incidents in other states that have moved beyond marijuana prohibition. Uh, last year, the Drug Policy Alliance released this report from Prohibition to Progress, highlighting what we've seen in all these states that have now moved beyond marijuana prohibition. We've seen reductions in DUIs. Um, we've seen child and youth use of marijuana remain stable post and after, um, before and post legalization. Um, and so we just want to push back on, on, on fallacies being told here to you. And so we'll, I'll send this, this report along so that you all can see uh, what we've seen from other states, uh, the nine states that have legalized marijuana um, and, and the District of Columbia as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. You have questions? Okay. Thank you all for your testimony. I just want to say something because um, multiple council members asked NYPD around opioid arrest and at trying to make the distinction between how the heroin crisis is being dealt with versus how marijuana arrests are being dealt with. And I think it's really important to recognize that Drug Policy Alliance does not think anyone should be getting arrested for opioids, right? And that um, it's important to distinguish that we don't need more of criminalization just to make it more equitable. We need everyone right, exactly, to not get arrested. Exactly. So and I just want to say and that's, that. And that's, and that's wholeheartedly where we were going. It's not, we don't want people being criminalized. We think right. prevention and and obviously other resources are, are more valuable perfect. in the long and term. I think so that's no, at perfect. least not my stance, but just so interested in looking at how the two. Perfect. So council <laughs> member, then I would ask that the um, council push um, the administration on their Healing NYC initiative that gives NYPD $70 million to turn overdose sites into homicide investigations, because that's not going to get us any further either. And we can also um, give you the report that Drug Policy Alliance has published on drug-induced homicides and how that gets us further away from our goal from making anyone safer. Yeah, great. Thank you, and we look forward to meeting and for the you numbers, soon. Councilman, for the numbers that you asked the NYPD for, you know, as a commanding officer, I got those numbers every week. So let's not, let's not I'm, play the game. I'm, Push I'm, for those I'm, numbers. I'm, 311 yes. numbers, every commanding officer get 311 exactly. numbers Agreed. every single week. Agree. I, I, I hear you and trust we know that answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the work you're doing. We're going to call the second panel. Um, Catherine Gonzalez, the Brooklyn Defender Services, Anthony Posada, the Legal Aid Society, Marsha John Charles, Brotherhood Sister Soul, and Charlotte Pope uh, from the Children's Defense Fund of New York. Ready, you may uh, begin. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Catherine Gonzalez, and I'm a staff attorney in the Criminal Defense Division of Brooklyn Defender Services. Every year, BDS represents thousands of people arrested for marijuana possession or sale, or fighting deportation, eviction, or a loss of parental rights due to marijuana-related allegations or convictions. BDS is proud to support the Drug Policy Alliance's Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act to legalize and sensibly regulate adult marijuana use and sale across New York State. And we urge the governor and the legislator to make it a reality. 
However, inaction in Albany is no excuse for injustice here in New York City. It is our position that the New York City Police Department can and should decline to arrest or to issue summons for people for marijuana procession or any other marijuana offense right now. Um, local district attorney's offices can and should decline to prosecute these cases right now. As a defense attorney, the most frustrating response from policymakers with respect to marijuana legalization is, I I'm not there yet. And with all the respect, what are you waiting for? Uh, when we're weighing the value uh, versus the impact that these arrests have in our communities, let's look at the data. Every single day, approximately 50 New Yorkers, mostly young men of color, are arrested for low-level marijuana possession, potentially sending their lives into disarray and the lives of their family and deepening the inequalities in our city. It's time to speak up and speak out. And with that in mind, I want to thank, thank Council Member Corey Johnson for announcing his support in ending the prohibition. There's no evidence to support the notion that punitive responses actually decrease marijuana use, if that's the goal. In fact, since legalization, marijuana by teens has decreased in Colorado, and that state is now generating more than one billion in economic activity and hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes from their legal uh, marijuana industry every single year. There's no justification for the status quo, and there's no justification to delay reform. A recent Emerson College, Emerson College poll showed that two to one uh, New Yorkers support legalization. Nonetheless, high marijuana arrest rates and sharp racial disparity continue as we have seen this morning. Um, in our written te testimony, we do provide detailed data demonstrating the racially biased enforcement of marijuana laws um, with respect to both possession and sale. And today I will limit myself to one point in my testimony. In my two and a half years as a defender with Brooklyn Defender Services, having represented hundreds of clients on marijuana charges, I can only recall representing one white person. And that white person I distinctly remember because she was charged with low-level possession while hanging out with a group of friends who were all people of color. Um, in the same way, I do want to uh, briefly tell you about... Uh, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up because we have to get out of here. Okay. Yeah, so if okay. you want to give a concluding statement, that's fine. But I've got questions. I want to get to those. Okay. So, yeah. you know, ending marijuana arrests and prosecutions here in New York City would get us meaningfully closer to um, getting rid of these racial disparities that are at the center of, of this conversation. And um, we want to add that instead of causing this harm, all of the resources that are being allocated to the enforcement of marijuana laws should be put to better use um, in our schools and in our communities. So I want to thank you for this hearing, and we hope that the council will support legalization. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank the chairperson, uh, both uh, Donovan Richards and Rory Lansman for having this he very critical hearing on these very important matters. My name is Anthony Posada. I'm a co-supervising attorney of the Community Justice Unit of the Legal Aid Society. The Community Justice Unit provides legal services to the cure violence organizations of New York City's crisis management system, uh, which are organizations that are devoted to turning their neighborhoods into safer and healthier places by looking at gun violence as a public health issue. Through this work, we are connected through communities all across New York City, and we can say that we have seen how marijuana enforcement from the NYPD destroys lives of all these youth and communities that are affected by over-policing. I just want to quickly highlight some of the testimony that I provided is, is significant, but I will keep, I'm not going to go through all of it entirely and just reserve my comments here to point out some of the key areas. Well, I want to begin with the collateral consequences of the marijuana arrests, which were already highlighted by this body, but just so that we don't forget them and so they are a part of the record. Marijuana arrests can lead to deportation. It could lead to an eviction. It has monetary fines that then become warrants when people are una unable to pay them. It results in the denial of financial aid, and it also creates a license suspension. New York's, the NYPD's marijuana enforcement drives hypercriminalization, and it's a dream, Jim Crow style form of policing. I can say this because I myself have been impacted by this style of policing. As a 17-year-old growing up in Queens as a Latino, 
I was affected when two undercover cops jumped out of their unmarked car and pointed their guns at my face and threw me up against the wall. I was charged with 22110, this very same provision that the same chief was saying here where police officers have a problem making that distinction. I can tell you that I was charged with that statute and the officer claimed that the marijuana was open in public view and in that same complaint it is in my pocket. So I don't understand how it could be open and burning in public view but still be remaining in my pocket. And still I have to undergo being taken to the precinct, being fingerprinted, having my property removed from me, then having to go through the system as a 17 year old I could have been prevented from going to college and thankfully that didn't happen, but if I lived in a NYCHA building, I could have been facing permanent exclusion and never going back to where my family lives and thankfully that was not the case, but it is the case for many New Yorkers, especially youth of color, who we have seen how this charge is one that puts them in a position where they feel stigmatized, where they're labeled as criminal, where they're afraid to walk their own blocks in their neighborhoods because they feel that the police are going to arrest them on this very exact charge. The arrest experience is not something that should be taken lightly and it's something that is, has far reaching psychological and trauma impacts that stay with the person for the rest of their life. Marijuana prohibition is not making us any safer right now. The way it is happening, it is just tearing communities apart. In our role in the Community Justice Unit, we were able to be a part of the joint remedial process that resulted after the stop and frisk was ruled unconstitutional. And having seen many of these joint remedial processes in Far Rockaway, in Staten Island, in Harlem, in South Jamaica, Queens, I can say that in all those hearings, all the youth and community members of color who have been there present to say, they have mentioned that NYPD's approach with marijuana is out of control, that it is abusive, that it is one that strikes terror into their communities, and it is one that makes them afraid. So this is a problem that continues to happen, that it's still happening, and we support full, full legalization, the SMART Act, also promoted by Drug Policy Alliance, as a way that it will make health communities safer and divert all those resources back into the community. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Yes, ma'am. And we're going to really ask you to adhere to the three minutes because we have another committee that we're delaying. Okay, so my name is Marcia Jean Chal. I'm representing the Brotherhood Sister Soul. Um, and really quickly, uh, we at the Brotherhood Sister Soul witnessed the realities of unequal and disproportionate marijuana policy enforcement time and again. We are founded in 1995 um, and we provide comprehensive, holistic, and long term support services to youth who range in age from 8 to 22. Uh, most importantly for this particular hearing, we are the people to whom our young people go when negatively impacted by the state and civil society. One of the biggest threats to our youth is criminalization of marijuana and its imbalanced enforcement. As you already know from various uh, testimonies, um, decriminalization has not stalled the arrests in our communities and in fact has furthered the criminalization and mass incarceration experience within them. Behind the often quoted decrease in marijuana arrests is the insidious issue of proportion. Firstly, for the last 20 years, the percentage of people the NYPD arrests for possession of marijuana has been at least 84% black and Latinx. Secondly, this inordinately racialized percentage of marijuana arrests exists in spite of countless studies that convey, as you know, that marijuana use across racial categories is similar in proportion to population percentage. The truth in all these numbers is that though use across race is virtually the same, black and Latinx youth in our city are criminalized, targeted, and incarcerated by our police as a result of disparate enforcement. It is without a doubt that black and Latinx people in New York City are disproportionately impacted by marijuana enforcement and targeted over policing of low-income communities. To pretend that this is not a reality would be to ignore the facts, the reports, the times, and public outcries for change. Many, though, are allowed to feign ignorance, principally because the NYPD does not publish information on arrests and criminal summonses for marijuana possession disaggregated by demographic information. Other entities, however, have published findings, and they prove undeniably that regardless of Mayor de Blasio's policy shift in 2014, black and Latinx people in New York City continue to be the main people arrested for marijuana possession and burning, the latter a matter the policy shift did not address, which further allows the NYPD to continue its discriminatory arrests and policing practices. Our organization is located in West Harlem slash Hamilton Heights, a neighborhood that, is report, that a report titled Unjust and Unconstitutional 60,000 Jim Crow Marijuana Arrests in Mayor de Blasio's New York calls the epicenter of NYPD enforcement. 
Accordingly, in 2016, the NYPD made strikingly more marijuana arrests in West Harlem than in any precinct in New York City, 48 times more such arrests than on the Upper East Side, despite West Harlem having one-third the population. Black and Latinx peoples were 94% of the people the police arrested for marijuana, 44% had never been arrested before, and 76% had never been convicted of a single misdemeanor. I'm going to ask you to wrap up. So, I mean, just in lieu, we are asking that you help ensure that our young people are not going to jail for, at disproportionate rates for possession of a substance that was theoretically decriminalized in 1977. And we further want to illustrate that our youth do not use more than others in wealthier, wider communities. They get arrested more, and that needs to end. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for the work your organization does. Uh, my name is Charlotte Pope. I'm with the Children's Defense Fund New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We want to highlight marijuana enforcement in city schools and the use and disproportionate impact of criminal court summonses. Our longtime concern has been that the NYPD and the School Safety Division impose criminal justice responses to student behavior that should be responded to by educators and school staff who are best equipped to carry out supports and interventions. Of the 805 total summonses given to young people in schools last year, 31% were given for possession of marijuana, representing the single most common reason for a summons in school. Due to gaps in the Student Safety Act data, we don't know the racial disparities in summonses by charge, but we do know that last school year, 94% of all summonses were given to students of color, with 52% of all summonses given to black students who only made up 27% of the student population. We support intro 605, and if it were to also include enforcement actions desegregated by whether the action occurred in a school building or on school property, it would bring even greater transparency to the policing of young people. Answering a summons not only demands students miss class time, but exclusion serves to stigmatize students and impede access to needed support or resources. It burdens young people with fines and court fees or potential warrants for missed court dates or inability to pay the fine. This potential for intensifying punishment is only imposed on students 16 and older while their 15-year-old classmates are already experiencing alternatives. In February of 2015, the NYPD launched a warning card pilot program on five school campuses in the Bronx that gives the NYPD the discretion to issue a warning card to students instead of issuing a summons for two infractions, possession of small amounts of marijuana and disorderly conduct. Last school year, because of the discretion loophole, there were still 20 summonses for marijuana given out on those school campuses. In February of 2017, the NYPD expanded the warning card program to a total of 71 schools, yet there are still hundreds of schools that educate students old enough to receive a summons. The yet-to-be-released revised Memorandum of Understanding between the Department of Education and NYPD, which was a project of the mayor's leadership team on school climate, must eliminate the use of summonses in school. Even ending summonses for low-level possession of marijuana would keep over 200 students a year from a string of negative consequences. We also want to make clear that all steps towards a positive school climate will come from alternatives from police responses, including training and support for educators and investment in school staff, such as mental health workers or restorative practitioners. Restorative practices in particular emphasize prevention and training the, changing the material conditions of students' lives to reduce harm and conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the work you do as well. I'm going to go to Councilmember Lansman for questions, and then we have one panel left. Thank you. Just to drill down, drill down on, on where my committee has specific jurisdiction, which is over the district attorneys and the public defenders, can you tell me what your experience has been, um, Brooklyn, and, and maybe if you can do Manhattan, um, well, but if you have Brooklyn as well, that's fine, with uh, that office's uh, supposed um, uh, marijuana and prosecution policy and, and what you're seeing on the ground. I make a brief reference to it in your testimony, but if you can, if you can tell me what you're seeing. So, so in, in Brooklyn, we're still seeing arrests for marijuana. Um, we see them every day. Sorry, just tell me, what do you understand the Brooklyn DA's policy to be? Our understanding was that they were going to decline to prosecute these cases. When you say these cases, what do you mean? And I, I, you're not representing their right. office, so I don't mean to put you on the spot. I just want to. My understanding as a defender, like on the ground, in court, low-level possession um, or marijuana-related arrests. Okay. We're, seeing, we're still seeing those arrests. Okay. And you're seeing the prosecutions, obviously. And we're seeing those prosecutions. And, and were you ever in a situation where you said to the ADA, 
at arraignment, hey, I thought this was part, of, this was uh, the kind of arrest, the kind of prosecution we were not going to see in your, in your policy? I do it in every single shift that I pick up a case. And um, they're, they're, you know, they're still coming, they're still coming through. And our position is that they, should, they shouldn't be coming through. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything you want to add either about Brooklyn, Manhattan, or anywhere else? Yeah, I would just add that we put out the numbers of the people we represented last year citywide. It was, in, it was 778 people on low-level marijuana charges, which was up from the January of 2017. And I would have had the full numbers for February, but the month not being over, we wanted to have a complete picture. But those numbers are still, have not changed. So they're still coming through. People are still getting charged with this. And just to echo my colleagues, uh, observations, the, the prosecutors are still going forward with these cases, even though the policy is there. And, and do you recall any specific instances where, where you or any of the legal aid attorneys said to prosecutor, hey, I thought under your new policy this particular case would not be covered? But and the reason I ask is, you know, we hear anecdotally, whether it's turnstile jumping or bail or, or any of the other things that the DAs or different DAs have announced that they're going to have a more uh, open liberal policy. Anecdotally, we, we hear where observers in court or um, public defenders uh, are, are, are seeing that those policies are not happening. And I don't really have a way to, to measure that. And so I was just wondering if you know, are aware of specific instances where the policy that the DA's office had publicly announced was not being ad adhered to. I, they, they are there, uh, and I don't have them for you right now, but I know that I can provide them to you. So here's, here's, here's what I request, and I very much appreciate your coming and testimony, uh, testifying today. If, when you get back to your offices, you could speak to your colleagues, the powers that be, et cetera, and if you can give us any guidance on how the policies that were articulated by the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office and the Manhattan District Attorney's Offices, which I think are the only two offices that have said they're going to have their own marijuana prosecution policy, have have not been adhered to or or are not being followed. That would help us in reaching out to those offices and saying, "Hey, what's 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 going on?" We'll do just really quickly. I want to point out what you all were finding out when asking the chief is that there, the synchronization is not there. If the arrests continue to happen at, at a hyper rate and they keep coming in, prosecutors are, are going forward with and are prosecuting as he right. himself <clears throat> right. testified. Well, that's, what I, that's what I was getting at and we're going to follow up with them about and I wanted to get feedback from you. And the feedback I get from you is going to be essential to the dialogue we're going to have with the police department, with, with the chief, because we're going <clears> to <throat> want to show, if true, you're making these arrests in Brooklyn and Manhattan <clears throat> that even the DAs are declining to prosecute. And so you're not synchronizing your policing policy with the other half of the criminal justice system, right? We also law and order, two halves, right? They gotta work together. So, um, so that'd be real helpful for you to get this to us. Thanks very much. Uh, gonna go to Council Member Miller and then to our last panel. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. So um, what I want to briefly ask is kind of a follow-up to Councilmember Lanceman, and that is kind of the coordination uh, around policy between NYPD and uh, the DAs um, citywide. And obviously, partic in particular, I'm concerned about the borough of Queens. Um, Councilman was just alluding to uh, whether or not somewhere like Brooklyn or Manhattan, the arrests were consistent with policy. Conversely, I would want to know if arrests are more, less driven by policy from the district attorney's office somewhere like the borough of Queens. Have, have you seen that because of a more aggressive, um, low-level, uh, prosecution policy that you see more arrests. 
Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Uh, and the end, there's, it doesn't meet out. So if you have a, a policy, a prosecution policy that says a certain of these charges will not be prosecuted, it's not adding up with what we're seeing. So in Queens, where the district attorney has not come forward to say we have a policy for not prosecuting marijuana arrests, marijuana arrests are happening in Queens, especially in, in the precincts that were highlighted throughout this hearing, um, and happening at an astronomical rate that is not justified by what we've heard today. So to, to answer your question, in boroughs where district attorneys have put forward a policy to say that they're not prosecuting marijuana, that I am saying right now we're still seeing those marijuana arrests coming through the system. They have not stopped coming through. And in boroughs where they don't have the policy, it, it just, it continues to be as business as usual, where the arrests are concentrated in communities of color. So in a borough where there is a very aggressive prosecution of marijuana and other low-level offenses, are the arrests consistent? In, in other words, so, so they have not just stopped coming, are they coming at the higher rate that they have been in the past? I can't speak for Queens. Um, I, will, I, I will point to um, a conversation that was started earlier where there was, a, there was a large conversation about the majority of these cases coming, being the result of 911 and 301 complaints in these communities. So that the numbers are higher in the 105th precinct, for example, in, in Queens because there are complaints within that community that are leading to either more policing or more responses to these neighborhoods that lead to these arrests. And it, as my, my, I only practice in Brooklyn, and in my experience in Brooklyn, I have never ever seen a charging document that says this arrest came from the officer receiving a 911 call or the officer receiving a 311 complaint of marijuana use. I've never seen a criminal case in Brooklyn charged that's come that I've been the attorney on where those are the allegations. And I, I can confidently say I don't know that those cases um, are, have been experienced by anyone in my office. There's no correlation, uh, at least when these cases are coming through arraignment, that there's, no, that there's no other indication that this was not because of a direct interaction with a police officer or their clients. That's what all these charging documents indicate, that these arrests are a result of these direct interactions and not the result of policing because there was a complaint made. And I think that that kind of speaks to your point as to the aggressive policing, but I can only speak to Brooklyn. So the response to your question is, is yes. Uh, in boroughs where there is not a policy the, and the arrests continue and are aggressive, they, they do, we have seen a rise in the number of how they're treated overall across the board. Thank you. All right, thank you all for your testimony. You're gonna go to the last panel now. Uh, Darian Agostini, I think I said it right, Make the Road, Kelly Grace Price, Jails Action Coalition, and Natalia, Natali am I saying it? N how I say it? Natasia Lopez, uh, Make the Road, New York. It's our last panel today. Again, sorry. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Natasia Lopez. I am 17 years old, a youth leader at Make the Road New York, and one of thousands of young people of color impacted by the problematic practices of cannabis enforcement. At the age of 16, I was arrested for smoking weed along with two friends. The police officers repeatedly asked us why we were so scared and said that it was just weed. Where these police officers may not consider it serious, cannabis is still one of the main reasons young people are pushed into the criminal justice system, the effects of which have, have serious and lasting impacts for us and our families. However, despite their passive type of language, the officer's behavior was angry and hostile. In the process of handcuffing my friend, a police officer slammed him to the ground, which led to my friend getting concussion. All of this for, as the police officer said, just weed. 
As frightening as this event was, thankfully I was able to walk away from the situation and return back to my community, while countless others are incarcerated or even killed for what should be minor interactions with police officers. Cannabis enforcement is harmful because it intentionally criminalizes communities of color for possessing and using cannabis, especially when compared to white communities who use just as much or more, but do not face the same level of hyper-aggressive policing. This policing puts young people like me through overwhelming conditions such as getting arrested and going through the process of being put through the system. This type of enforcement has culminated to the reality that within our public schools, cannabis is the second highest reason for summons, with the highest percentage of those arrests being youth of color. As people, we deserve to be treated with basic dignity and respect. Cannabis enforcement does not apply those values to us, but instead locks us in cells while many of us are already locked within ourselves. However, Council, I do not want you all to think to perceive this as a call to provide cannabis to 16-year-olds, but rather a call to rethink the way in which we have dealt with this issue and undo the harm that generations of criminalization has caused. We need systems of support. We need policies that provide equity and safety and doesn't criminalize communities of color. Cannabis enforcement policies do not do that. What does provide these values for our communities would be a process where we legalize cannabis, wipe clean the records of people we have convicted and imprisoned for cannabis, and ensure legalization provides reparations and restitution to the communities that have bore the burden of racialized drug policies. I would like to close out with the quote. Howard Zare once said, I have a dream that we won't have to talk about restorative justice because it will be understood that true justice is about restoration and about transformation. I have a dream. We share this dream for the future of our communities and we hope you do too, Council. Thank you. Thank you so much for your powerful testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, peace and good afternoon, Council. My name is Darian Agostini. I am 23 years old and a youth organizer for, for police accountability at Make the Road New York. Uh, my role as a youth organizer, uh, as a youth organizer, I am in a position where the youth that I work with regularly talk to me about their experiences being policed, many of which look like police stopping them, asking them if they have marijuana, and in many cases, searching them to uh, illegally searching them to find said marijuana. Council, it is these moments that have driven me to testify before you today, where when I hear these stories, I cannot help but remember my own experiences in high school not too long ago. I, like thousands of other young people across the city, grew up and went to a school in an uh, overly policed yet intentionally underfunded neighborhood. At 16, I was stopped with a group of friends by plainclothes officers who asked us where the weed at as soon as they approached us. The police officers, with no evidence that my friends and I actually possessed any marijuana, separate us and uh, search us individually. After finding a small about, amount of marijuana, about a gram worth, near my, book, my, my friend's book bag, uh, the police asked whose it is. When none of us reply, the police uh, look at me and say, well, I guess this is yours, because I was the eldest of the group at the time. Incidents like this continue to be an everyday occurrence for youth of color in, in our communities, with nearly two in five or 38 percent of those arrested in 2017 for marijuana being under 21 years old. And the disparity in arrests between young people of color and their white peers has never decreased. These unnecessary arrests for small amounts of marijuana create conditions in the lives of our communities that are difficult and at times even impossible to surmount. For me, this was almost a year of returning back and forth to court, which meant losing important hours of school. And for my mother, it meant losing time and money at work uh, to attend those court sessions with me, which was a luxury that we couldn't afford then and still can't afford today, to be honest. Uh, the judge, in my case, wanted to give me a curfew of 6 p.m., which, if she hadn't stated, would have prevented me from attending a college, uh, college Now course on criminal justice and my regular band practices, essentially disconnecting me from the resources and the community in, in a very vital way. Uh, Council, I say all of this to reiterate what has been said a million times before me today, that marijuana enforcement just doesn't work. Uh, instead of keeping young people away from drugs, Policing us has led to generations of young people being criminalized as either drug users or drug sellers and prevented whole communities from having access to higher education, health care, public housing, and, many, and in many cases, even a safe immigration status. We can no longer continue to enforce policies and practices that are racially incentivized, separate families, and criminalize young people. True sanctuary doesn't mean we have sentries on every corner rummaging through the pockets of every person on the street. 
We must restore the harm of generations with legislation that legalizes marijuana while simultaneously wiping clean the records of people who are or have been incarcerated for marijuana. This is not a matter of, as some in the opposition may say, placating potheads, but rather a matter of providing equity to communities who have too long been crushed by the crucible of criminalization. We hope that you see this, this, as, as, this in the same manner as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Wow, the crucible of criminalization. My name is Kelly Grace Price. I'm the communications co-chair for the Jails Action Coalition. And unlike these amazing youth leaders, I will not be sharing my age with the council chambers this afternoon. But I will just add something very quickly. I don't, I'm always the last one to testify. Um, Brian knows this. I'm always the last one to testify. And, and Councilwoman Gibson knows this. I, I, I like to testify last, and I, I, I didn't mean to testify today, but I, I want to add something as an end note. Um, we've noticed <clears throat> in all of the groups that I'm associated with and that I, I volunteer at, um, that across the board there is one subset of the population that keeps being stuck with the discretionary loophole. Um, these are people that have been labeled in the NYPD CompStat database or the Domain Alert Awareness database, whatever they're calling it these days, as people that need to be incapacitated by the criminal justice system. Now, those aren't my words. Those are Cy Vance's words himself. Um, uh, I often quote a New York Times Magazine article from December 2015 where Cy Vance talks about when he sat down with Chauncey, his favorite deputy district attorney, and decided to imbue Palantir Technologies into the NYPD. Now, I'm a person that does not have a criminal record. I'm very lucky. I was charged with 324 counts of the now unconstitutional CPLR 240.30, which was the um, aggravated harassment statute. I didn't do anything wrong. I was being beaten silly by one of Cy Vance's confidential informants. I got all of those charges dismissed and sealed, but because of the way that I am labeled in the NYPD databases at every point of police interaction, I, I don't get any results. A couple months ago, my evil um, orthodox landlord up in Washington Heights locked all of uh, the tenants out of our building. I called the NYPD because NYPD handbook procedure number 117.10 requires a summons to be issued when keys are changed on apartment buildings and for an arrest to be made immediately if the situation isn't remediated. Because of the way that I'm labeled in the NYPD database, the police literally laughed at me and made me go to the psych ward. This, I'm not kidding, these are things that happen every day to people that are uh, inappropriately demarcated in your NYPD database. These are the same people that are being arrested for low-level marijuana infractions. Councilwoman Gibson, you may remember last summer, you specifically grilled uh, Byrne, I don't know what his title is, lawyer, big man at the M NYPD. You, you specifically asked him to give you data on what constitutes a, a transit recidiv recidivist because the NYPD keeps saying those are the only people that keep being arrested for turnstile jumping. I'm quite certain that the NYPD still has not provided you the definition of what a transit recidivist is at, at this point in time, because the NYPD never seems to come back and provide you with the data that you asked for in these council meetings. But these are the people that are keep being arrested, and I would highly encourage you, if you want to end these problems across the board for people being issued summonses for double parking. I know a woman that was arrested for not picking up dog poop. <clears throat> These things happen all the day in New York, uh, every day in New York City, and the people being arrested for the low-level marijuana infractions, as my colleagues at BDS and LAS have told you in the courtrooms that keep happening every day. We now have Court Watch NY NYC that is recording, actually, the, the arraignments. These are the people that are demarcated as persona non grata in the NYPD database, and I highly encourage you to really drill down into that um, Byzantine process of labeling people in a McCarthyistic manner as people uh, that need to be over prosecuted or not to have their complaints taken by the NYPD. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take a whole three minutes, but thank you so much for listening thank to me. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your testimony. I want to thank uh, the committee staff, uh, Beth Golob, Casey Addison, Stephen Resta. I also want to thank uh, the Justice Systems uh, Committee and uh, Council as well, Sheila Johnson, a financial analyst, uh, Brian Crow, the senior legislative counsel, and my colleague uh, and colleagues for uh, their testimony today. We look forward to continuing to work on this issue, and uh, we will be following up with the NYPD uh, shortly. So thank you all for coming out today. This hearing is now closed.